I want to welcome everybody back to being alive, and uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a real blessing to, uh, to be where we are today uh, in good health with uh, hope in our future that things are going to get better. So we appreciate everybody being here and for cooperating during this transition to normalcy. So, okay, our first item of business today is to take up our meeting minutes and decision letters from our January 7th meeting. Uh, that was the last time we met in session. So uh, we have some new technology today. We're going uh, largely paperless, so everybody has a tablet. All the files, um, with the exception, I think, of the decision letter, which is on the screen, should be on your tablet. Uh, so if you'd like to look over the minutes uh, and particularly glance at your screens to see um, the relevant portion of the decision regarding the decision letter. Um, we'll give you a second or two to contemplate whether or not you've had adequate time and, and whether or not you want to make a motion to approve the minutes and decision letters in one motion. So. Chairman, I'll make a motion to approve the January 7th meeting minutes and the associated approval level. Okay, we have a motion to approve the minutes and decision letters for January 7th, 2021. Is there a second? I'll second. All right, motion been made and properly second. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those signify by saying aye in your mic. You'll have to press the, uh, the little person button there on the right so we're not used to doing that. All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 All right, all those opposed? All right, motion passes unanimously. Okay, um, before we go to our next item of business, I'd just like to uh, pause for a minute and recognize that we have two new board members, uh, Mr. Trey Lewis and Mr. Kabir Sundu. Did I pronounce that right? Yes. All right thank you, sir. So uh, I didn't have a chance to tell you, Mr. Sundu, that I'm going to ask you all to introduce yourselves just a little bit if you like. So I'll go with Mr. Lewis while you have a chance to collect your thoughts. And so Mr. Lewis, uh, we'd love to learn a little bit more about you. Very nice to have you here, sir. Welcome. All right, Mr. Sandu. Thank you, Chairman, for the introduction. My name is Kabir Sandu. I'm a Nashville native and uh, licensed professional engineer and uh, in, in the continue to be in the construction and development world. And I'm happy to be with you all here in person today. This is refreshing to be back live. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Welcome to both of you. Welcome, Mr. Sandu. All right. Uh, so we... Uh, are taking up uh, the matter of ethics training from Metro Legal at this point on the agenda. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Do you want me to do it now or do you want to let the presentations go forward and then like do it at the end? Uh, I can do it either way. Uh, why, don't we, why don't we shift this to the end? So uh, and since we have folks here here on their own time, let them get back to their lives. So, so that sounds like a great suggestion. So, all right, so our first case is uh, Item number 2021-00003, Lake Providence Missionary Baptist Church. I'm going to ask for a reading of our normal legal statements and introduction of the case by staff. The opening statements of the applicant. If you are not satisfied with a decision made by the Stormwater Management Committee, you may appeal the decision by filing for a writ of certiori with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the committee's decision. You are advised to seek the independent advice of legal counsel to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been satisfied. Okay, staff, you want to introduce the case details and after staff gets through introducing the case, we'll ask our uh, applicants to make a few remarks. Uh, you'll be limited to about 10 minutes. And then after that, we'll open the floor up for a public comment for those for and against. Uh, and then we'll close the public hearing and we'll have discussion amongst ourselves as uh, committee members. And we may ask you some further questions after that. So if you'll introduce yourself, ma'am. I'll go ahead and read the case, Chairman. 
This is Steve Mishu. Uh, it's case number 2021-00003, Lake Providence Church, Council District 04, Councilman Swope, at the address of 5891 Nolensville Pike. The parcel number is 172-000-07900. The case description is request to an appeal the adverse decision of Metro Water Services and PDS Department regarding a notice of noncompliance to Lake Providence Missionary Baptist Church located at 5891 Nolensville Pike, Nashville, Tennessee, 37211, for disturbance of a regulated stream buffer. The no, dis the no disturb stream buffer requirements went into effect as a result of the original development activity under grading permit 2001096. A notice of noncompliance was presented to Lake Providence, August 14, 2021, informing the church that it was in violation of a no disturb no disturb stream buffer requirement that went into effect as a result of the original development activity under grading permit 2001096. Notice stated cutting the trees disturbed a regulated stream buffer and was in direct violation of uh, Metro National Stormwater Management Manual section 6.9. The appellant is appealing to the decision of Metro Water Services. Thank you, Mr. Michoud. Does our staff member at the podium have any other thing to add to the case summary? Actually, I have um, a presentation, and uh, Liz will be uh, covering the last slide of it. All right, thank you. Uh, my name is Rebecca Doan. I am with the Stormwater MPDS Department, and um, we put together a few slides to take you through the history of the Lake Providence Missionary Baptist Church uh, properties interactions with our department. Um, way back in the aughts, and um, I actually, <laughs> I have to say I, I did work here back then, um, the church applied for a variance to clear their buffer along Whittemore Branch. Um, the variance, number 2275, was granted and it allowed for the removal of some of the trees, uh, continuous mowing of the buffer, but they were not supposed to um, uh, maintain anything along the, the bank. They submitted a set of plans showing the trees that would remain along the buffer to the MPDS department. Uh, we inspected and improved the site as compliant and signed off, I believe it was Ann Morbitt who signed off on the site in 2004. Um, fast forward to mm -hmm. August of 2020, uh, Sean Herman, one of our inspectors, was um, driving down Nolansville Road and noticed that the trees had been cut down. He took some pictures and forwarded them to me, our uh, Metro Arborist, Eric Keeler, then went out and uh, surveyed the removals based upon the remaining stumps. Um, we discussed this with the Urban Forest Road Code, Stefan Kivett, and he suggested that um, we do an inch for inch replacement. Um, 87 trees were taken down, which totaled over 1,500 inches diameter at breast height. Um, if we had followed uh, Stefan Kivitz's suggestion, that would have been 777 two-inch trees, and we decided that was um, a little too much to request for replacement. So what we decided to use instead was um, a replacement schedule established by Executive Order Number 5. Now, Executive Order Number 5 relates to tree removals on Metro properties, so it's not exactly apples to apples, but they do have a schedule uh, established by that that counts the number of trees that should be replaced for the number of trees taken down. So for example, if the tree was less than 10 inches, you, re you replant one. If it's between 10 and 15 inches, you replant two, all the way up to four trees if the tree taken down was greater than 20 inches. So in using that schedule, um, we calculated 238 trees would need to be replanted. And that was what was put into the notice of noncompliance, which was issued by our department, which also required that a set or a landscape architect prepare the site plans. So um, Lake Providence, uh, in response to the notice of noncompliance, submitted two different landscape plans. Um, the, the first one had 63 trees on it, which was um, 175 trees short of the requirement. Uh, their second submittal was uh, still 164 trees short at 74 trees. So um, we tried to figure out if we could reach a compromise um, on the number of trees to plant. So first, I'll go back to this one. Since they were proposing longer tr or larger trees than we were requiring, we were only requiring inch and a half caliper and their proposal was uh, two and a half inch trees and three inch trees. 
we decided we could use count the caliper inches for, um, for their compliance. Now, we, we still prefer a greater number of smaller trees as the Department for Water Quality, but we decided to, to, to give on this side a little bit. So 238 inch and a half trees would be 357 cumulative um, inches. And the applicant at that point was proposing 197 cumulative inches. So this still resulted in a 160 inch deficit, which would only work out at this point to be 53 trees. 53 three inch trees. So, and we also um, said that they could plant trees outside the buffer because we understood the site was limited and they wanted more sight lines to their church. Um, we then proceeded to have an additional compromise that we allow only 75% only survivability. So whenever we issue um, landscape plans from the stormwater management, committee, we always say two years, 75% survival rate. So we decided to grant that on the front end. And so only if we decided that only 75% of the trees needed to survive and they agreed to replant every tree that died, they would then only um, need to plant 24 more three inch trees to be in compliance with our um, notice of non-compliance. So to summarize, the original requirement per our notice of non-compliance was for 238 trees. Um, we compromised with either 89 three inch trees or 107 uh, two and a half inch trees. We still couldn't um, come to an agreement at this point. And so we are now here at the Stormwater Management Committee. Again, um, I guess this is an appeal of our notice of noncompliance, but it could also be considered a, a rehearing because they're in violation of their original variance. Um, now I would like to introduce Liz Steinstraw. She is the inspector for the area and um, is gonna briefly go over the timeline of our interactions. Liz? So um, up on the, the PowerPoint here, she has our timeline listed and we've kind of worked with them for a little while now, about a year it's taken to kind of talk with them and make sure that we've met and make sure everyone was understood and heard. So at the time of discovery, it was 7-24-2020. And then after that, we've met Pretty, pretty quickly, I think. Um, the NON was issued in August. And then after that, we had several on-site meetings. And then we also had a Zoom meeting. And so I'll just kind of run down the timeline just to kind of give everybody an idea of what we did. Um, after the NON was issued, we had an on-site meeting on 9-11. We were then given an extension request by the site for one month. Um, on 10-5, we were given another um, on-site meeting with everyone who was there. So that was all of our uh, participants with legal and all of their representatives with their legal as well. And then on 10-13, we were given a second request for extension and that re request was for two months. And then on the uh, 30th of November, we had a Zoom meeting and then we had a conceptual drawing emailed to us by Lake Providence on the 20th. And then the 24th, we responded with our preliminary questions from that initial drawing conception. And then we had a um, rescheduled Zoom meeting. And then we had a third extension request for a month. And then we had a uh, email final comments because at that point we had determined that was kind of all the abilities and allowances we could give to them without coming to the stormwater management committee. And so that's kind of where we are. Okay, great. Um, so before we proceed to the applicants next to hear their presentation, I just want to ask one quick question. Is, is your latest compromise proposal kind of your current position? Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. All right. So at this time, we'd like to invite uh, our applicants uh, to speak. I uh, want to encourage you to limit your presentation to about 10 minutes if possible. And uh, if we need more time, we'll evaluate that at the end of the 10 minutes. So, uh, all right. And Brother Maxwell, I, I think someone's going to help you push a button there to turn your mic on since we're recording and live. We haven't been here in a while, so we're trying yeah. to figure out. How. There we go. There we go. Okay. And if I'm you Bruce Maxwell. I'm the pastor of Lake Providence Baptist Church. Uh, wanted to just give you all some more history behind why we we did not do this. 
to be in defiance with Metro whatsoever to remove the trees, but on the first Sunday of May of last year, there was a storm that moved through. There were several of those trees that fell. There were some up against uh, the cable lines and different things like that, and one that had just fallen completely out into the street. And I think that Metro came by and cut back those branches that were in the street. But there were at least eight or more trees that were blown down. And at that time when it was blown down, we contacted Metro to see if they were responsible for getting them up. And they said it was private property. We also contacted some other agencies, the cable companies, as well as uh, I think it was TDEC and Wild, Wild Fish Game and Wildlife to see whether or not those trees could be removed. Well, the guy from Fish, Game, and Wildlife, which was Scott Hall, I think, that came out, he told us we, uh, the crayfish was no longer an endangered, or they were taken off the endangered species list. And he informed us we could take out what we wanted to. We were not planning on just taking out everything, just leaving it bare. We had... Uh, plans to replant some trees in that area. Uh, but after all of that was cleared out, that's when we received the letter uh, on 814, I think it was, after we had cleared it out, we received a letter from Metro stating that we were in non-compliance and that had to be replanted to uh, support the buffer there. Well, with that, if you look at the pictures that we submitted, tree, the, the, the limbs or the roots of the trees were being compromised and those trees would have eventually fallen. That's the reason why we took out those that were being compromised. There were others in that area that were not, but we decided to take them out so that something better could be put in there and the planning would have been more aesthetically pleasing to the community and make the property look good. We've always tried to keep up our property since moving there in 20, uh, uh, 2003. And we've always tried to keep it looking you know, very good for the community because we did not want to be uh, uh, a neighbor in the community that would really depreciate what was going on there whatsoever. So this is, that was the reason why those trees were removed. Now part of that property, and that's on the south end of it, the state has already purchased that property for the widening of Nolan's Road. And if you all had listened to the news here recently, the road is, the construction on Nolan's Road to be widened is to begin in spring of next year. Uh, we've already sold that little parcel as to where the state wants. So that has already been sold to the state of Tennessee. It wouldn't make sense to plant on that side that's nearest Nolan's Road uh, because they're gonna be taken back out when that construction begins. Now on this side, there is place places for planning and we're planning on, we were planning on putting something back in there. But before that all happened, we received the letter that we were in non-compliance, so everything stopped at that time. But yes, we did take it out, but it was not in defiance against what Metro had stated to us earlier in the building process. And trees had fallen before that we had had cleaned up and uh, one at a time and all, but the storm was the reason why we did what we did on May 1st, the first part of May, first Sunday of May. Thank you, uh, Brother Maxwell, appreciate that. I uh, mm -hmm. hope you don't mind me calling you Brother Maxwell. That's fine. Uh, and I come from that background, so. Uh, <laughs> I, I, do you have another uh, representative that would like to speak? We do. Um, my name is James Johnson. I'm legal counsel for Lake Providence Missionary Baptist Church, and this is Clyde Roundtree, who is the uh, architect, the landscape architect, and he wants to uh, do his part of the presentation now. All right, thank you, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, JJ. Uh, Chairman Gilmer, my name is Clyde Roundtree, and I'm with Roundtree and Associates, landscape architects, and, and uh, Lake Providence hired me to to create a, a mitigation plan for this particular situation. And after meeting with the church and looking at the situation, there were several things we had to consider. Um, the biggest things we were working through is 
stormwater is concerned was um, making sure that the root structures were going to be stabilized as far as all the existing root structures. That was really, that was all that was holding the bank in place. So that meant that anything we were going to do in the immediate vicinity of the, the creek bank was have to be grasses. So something we can literally work within the root structure of the uh, existing existing trees, be it they are no longer living, but that root structure is still intact. So our first strategy, what's shown in the hatched area on the um, on the overall exhibit for the design, was to stabilize the bank. The second layer of landscaping was to create an intermittent layer, more of a shrub layer, something that would create habitat and allow us to have a full look. I mean, that was one of the things I think that Stormwater was concerned about, was making sure it was a pretty full look landscape um, prior to the storm hitting. So we wanted to go back and make sure that we were providing adequate material to kind of give it a, a look as well, as far as more of a dense look. And then we decided that it'd be great to have a combination of accent trees, because they would grow a little bit faster, they could create a little bit more canopy quicker and then shade trees as well. So we, we kind of took a strategy of trying to um, cluster and mass the planting in such a way that it gave it somewhat of a natural look, um, but also try to meet the satisfaction of storm, uh, the bank restoration as well as the, um, I know there's a, a, a crayfish that's in this area that's a real shade sensitive crayfish, so that was one of the things we're trying to get some canopy back as quickly as we can, and hence the, um, the accent trees came into play there. And so the challenge we we're facing is that we can't get too close to the creek bank because we basically, any effort we did to try to restore it by planting trees um, would actually de deteriorate it as well. So, so we, we went through the design, as I mentioned, there were two different concepts. Um, one was less trees. We added more trees to try to fulfill uh, the expectations. But one of the things we're running into is the church maintains that area right now. I, the original, variants allowed them to mow that area. So if you go out there right now, it's mowed. It's a very clean looking area. And so when we heard the request for 278 one inch trees, we were trying to figure out how we'd maintain that from a maintenance standpoint. How would we even get a mower in there? And we, we, we were concerned that we didn't have running over half the trees because they'd be more of a sapling versus a tree. And so we felt like it would be best from the church's vantage point because they maintain that to go with something larger. So that's where the larger trees came from is that they would be more established. We felt like we could get a, lar a higher survival rate with the larger trees. And it just gave a real clear delineation of where you maintain and where you didn't maintain. So that was our overall approach. Um, we felt like we could meet the expectations for, you know, again, this is gonna take a little time for the light and the, the shading that was required for the creek bank, the stabilization that was gonna be required. Um, but we also wanted to make sure that, you know, I think part of the, the, the challenge we were facing is that some of the stormwater numbers were related to both sides of the creek. And the, as Pastor mentioned, the parameters changed. The other side of the, the creek has basically become road widening. So we also felt like the number that was being represented to us was, was the whole creek bank. And, and we felt like there's no way that we could put that quantity of plant material on that one side. I mean, if it was both sides, that'd be a different story. But when it became obvious that the road was gonna widen, that we're really working with one side, we were just trying to figure out, I mean, how do you put that amount of trees in that amount of space? And for that to be something that could really accomplish the survivability of the tree, as well as just the overall maintenance of the area. So the plan we submitted was what we felt like met the expectations that we were, we were given uh, and also something that the church could afford to do as far as we felt like there was a, a viability to making sure it could actually be done. So with those, those considerations, that's what we presented to Stormwater. So we've worked, with, we worked back and forth and as a landscape architect, in my professional opinion, we could add a few more trees, but, but we're not really getting anything from it. It's just, it's just creating more potential density in the area and then some trees will get shaded out. And, and so we were looking for the overall success of the goal. And the goal was to restore the creek bank area and to reestablish some habitat along that bank. And if you look at the plan, it's not a plan that looks like we were trying to, you know, trying to just, just not plan at all. I mean, I feel like there's, there's more plans than I would naturally put here as a landscape architect, but, but I knew we had some expectations as far as fulfilling some requirements. And the other, the other question was, shrubs are not really considered in the mix as far as the, the restoration process. And we felt like shrubs would be kind of part of the mix in the fact that they are, you know, they also are a stabilizer. They can go in the ground quickly. They can have some immediate impact as far as root structure. 
And so, um, and there weren't, there wasn't credit given to shrubs to the best of my recollection. It's been a little bit while. And that was just because the ordinance doesn't really have anything written how shrubs could actually apply towards credit. So between the grasses and the shrubs, we feel like there is some, there is some commitment towards the goal that's not really being quantified from a, from a caliper standpoint. So that, that's the overview of the design. Um, I think the church would be happy to impl implement this design. I feel like from a, uh, from a design standpoint, it meets the objectives. And at the end of the day, I think it still allows the church to have a, a, a pleasant looking front yard at the end of the day as well. So those are all the, the areas that I was working through with the church. And if you have any questions specifically for me for the design, I'd love to answer those. Thank you. Thank and you. Would, uh, would you repeat your last name, please? Sir? Roundtree with no D, R-O-U-N-T-R-E-E. -E. Okay, Roundtree. Right, Mr. Johnson, do you have any closing remarks? We're at the end of your I, last time. I will. I will give my closing remarks. I'll be brief. <clears throat> uh, first of all, uh, the question arose whether or not this cause of action arose because of our violation and we did not obtain consent uh, to cut down the trees. As Pastor has testified to, we did obtain consent. We obtained consent from TDEC. Uh, a representative came out, met with the, with the church, gave them consent to cut down the trees, although it later turned out that TDEC did not have jurisdiction over this matter. So we did obtain uh, consent, we, what we thought was consent, and then afterwards we received the letter. Secondly, uh, as Mr. Roundtree has testified to, his plan complies with the regulations uh, of stormwater management 6.9.61, which is at issue here. His plan addresses the restoration of the buffer. It also addresses the filtration, providing filtration, providing a canopy area to that, uh, and providing uh, erosion prevention of the embankment and attempting to stabilize the embankment. That's what his plan addresses. And thirdly, um, I think this is important to understand. Um, Metro has, for the first time today, we've heard about a compromise. Mm -hmm. Metro's position with us was always they wanted us to replant 238 trees. And that's where we reached impasse with them and decided to come to the Stormwater Management Commission. Today is the first time that we've seen their response where they've talked about presenting a compromise of doing 89 three inch trees or 107 2.5 inch trees. Uh, we have to take a look at that. I've just presented it to, to, to Pastor and to Mr. Roundtree. Uh, we might be able to reach some sort of compromise with that, uh, but I think we'd have to sit down and, and take a look at it. But that's, today is the first time that we heard anything from Metro about compromising. Their position to us was always put in 238 trees. And as Ms. Dunn said, they even told us that we could put the trees down near the creek or put the trees away from the creek, up near the church's property. But putting them away from the church property would not restore the buffer. So our position today is pretty straightforward, uh, that we think that the plan that we have presented, it complies with the regulations. It meets all the requirements of restoring the, the buffer zone, uh, that stream buffer, and we respectfully request that our plan be approved today. Uh, thank you, Mr. Johnson. I appreciate it. The last thing that I would like to say, and <clears throat> uh, since all of this occurred, we're just asking for leniency from this committee because during that time of the storm and everything blew the roof, we had to replace the roof of the church. And I know that's not a concern for you guys, but this res restoration plan is going to end up costing us quite a bit of money to restore. And I mean, we have spent over half a million dollars already to get the roof put back on and different things like that. Uh, this plan that is being presented will cost us between 19 to 25, 24, 25 thousand dollars, and we're just trying to do something that is financially also feasible and aesthetically pleasing to our community. So I just want to point that out also, okay? Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Brother Maxwell. Okay, so at this point, uh, we've heard from staff and uh, the applicants, and so we're gonna open up our public hearing now for anyone who would like to speak uh, in regard to um, uh, this matter. So if there's anyone here who'd like to speak um, in favor of the applicant's case, uh, please come to the mic. 
Introduce yourself, state your address uh, if you live in Davidson County, and we'll give you about two minutes to share your comments. All right, seeing none, is there anyone here to speak uh, in opposition to what the applicant has presented in like manner? All right, seeing Mr. none, Chairman. we'll proceed to uh, reading it, to looking at our letters. Yeah, Mr. Mishu. I was just going to let you know that there was three comments that, three uh, emails that were sent to us. All right, that's, that's what I was getting ready for. So uh, all of the um, uh, commission members should have the letters in, on your uh, electronic device. If you want to glance at those, uh, you're welcome to do that. Would anybody like to uh, characterize what the general theme of those comments are in general? Would staff like to characterize that, Mr. Mishu? Sure. Uh, you know, we've had a lot of uh, feedback from the neighbors, uh, but there was only uh, two responses and then a watershed alliance. Uh, they were all pretty supportive. Uh, the two emails were supportive of uh, staff's recommendation of the more trees, and uh, they, would, uh, they would sure like to see a lot more trees be put in there. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mishu. All right, so uh, now that we have uh, checked to see if we have any uh, public comment and seeing none other than the emails that we received, we're going to close the uh, public comment period now and we're going to begin discussion amongst ourselves. Uh, while the various commission members are thinking, I'd like to ask a, just a few quick salient questions that'll, that maybe will help us all kind of focus on some of the core details. Um, Mr. Mishu, how many linear feet of stream are we talking about here trying to recover? I do not know. I'm wondering if Rebecca or Liz knows. Or does the lands to, to landscape architect it. know? Can you? I believe it's 940 feet and there is an easement that runs through that as well. Is that, is that the cumulative total of both sides? That, that's probably the distance of the whole area versus less the driveways and less there's an easement that runs through. Okay. All right, so that helps, that helps me a lot. Okay, and then uh, secondly, um, is staff familiar with the uh, TDOT acquisition of land? Does, can, you, can you all show us a map? Is that going to happen? It, is, is right away being acquired? Yes, and um, we, we had that discussion with them early on in the process, and that's when we allowed for the plantings to be only on the church side of okay. the street and also allowed for plantings to be on other areas within okay. their site. All right, so you support the applicant's uh, position on that. Okay. All right, and then... Uh, Let's see here, there was another one. Uh, okay, Mr. The, Chairman? Uh, yes. I did a quick measure based on the GIS, and I think the applicant's right. I got around about 1,000 feet of uh, road frontage where the buffer exists. From one side of the property to the other? Yes, sir. So it'd be about 2,000 feet on both sides. Cumulative, if, if they had to do both sides. So they only have to do one side. Okay. All right, that, that, that's one. That, that's an important point that I'll come to in just a minute. All right, uh, legal, um, I'll do... Um, do, you, do we have any record of the mowing of the variants that they referenced in their testimony previously? Does anybody know what that's about? Any the staff know what that's about? I'll, um, I'll pull up the variants. Hold on. Okay. See you. <laughs> Were you waiting for something else? Uh, is the uh, is this the variance in front of us here? Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. So. Where 
or is the reference to mowing? The, the, the applicant mentions something. Okay, there we go. All right, all right. So I think that's some of the key information that I think may help us. So uh, at this time, I'd like to recognize, recognize Mr. Dale. So. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Reverend Maxwell, I've been to your church many times. I've had community meetings there. Uh, you do a great outreach with the community, and I know that we appreciate what you do in that community. Um, when I look at this, I know that this was not anything malicious. I'm 100% of that, convinced of that. I know that. And I sort of feel like that the basis of which Metro started was like uh, from an urban forester perspective. He's looking at the number of trees and the, and the units and the, and the linear feed and the calipers of the trees. And I think that from my perspective, we should be looking at something a little different than that. And that's just the, what is necessary to restore the, to creek, the creek itself, uh, the tributary, to stabilize it and the number of trees necessary in order to do that. And so at this point, I have to look at the landscape, ar landscape architect, and, and if he feels that's adequate, then I'd have to listen to that. But that's sort of my basis, Dodd, that I'm sort of thinking about this, planting hundreds of trees. I'm not sure what that really accomplishes from our perspective. There may be something with the Coast Department or something with the urban forester that needs to be addressed. But from our perspective, I think what we need to be looking at is what's necessary to restore the, the, the tributary. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Dale. All right, any other commission members want to comment? Was, Ms. Maddox. I was wondering if you've seen the proposed plans for the Nolensville Road ex expansion? We have. Uh, we have. We've seen the expansion. The area in which the state has purchased from us, which is a triangular piece on the south side of the property, what our understanding is, is that piece of property will be used during the widening for the storage of possibly where they're blasting or whatever, some rock and things, and they're going to protect that from the stream itself where it would wash back in. After that, it's supposed to be graded uh, uh, with a slope, if I'm not mistaken, back into the property. I don't think much of that will be used as far as the widening of Nolan's Road. The majority of the widening of Nolan's Road is actually going to go to the east side of the property because they do not want to get in the creek. We won't give them the creek if they had wanted it, you know, uh, as to where <laughs> they could have put a culvert over it, whatever they wanted to do. We were happy just to give it to them if they want the state. But they do not want to get in that creek whatsoever, and they're trying to protect the wildlife, the crayfish, and all that type of stuff that's in that creek. Um, uh, so right now, I've seen it, but it's going to the east side of Nolan's Road, the widening is. All right. That satisfy you, Ms. Maddox. Um, I, can we see a, a map? I guess I'm, I'm not sure of the orientation of their property. Mm -hmm. So the widening's going to the east, mm -hmm. and then... Back up. That's Hickory Chapel Funeral Home across the street from the church. Mm -hmm. And from what we have seen, Hickory Chapel Funeral Home's driveway is supposed to come right in the area of Shadow Glen and angle back up. It's what uh, has been shown from the maps that have been given. The area down from there where the parking lot is south of Hickory Chapel Funeral Home, that is now Airmark. Part of that parking area through there, and that has been a big obstacle for the widening, and I think they may have taken it by eminent domain. But uh, they're gonna lose that front part right there near Nolansville Pike 
of their parking lot. So the widening is actually going through there. And we still can't figure out why the builders were allowed to build up to Nolan's Road down there at Lenox Village. Mm -hmm. And where's the portion of the stream we're concerned with? The stream is running, yeah. Through, see the red line down through there? That's the stream. If you can see that. Yeah. Yeah, that right in there. That's the stream. And a pretty wide buffer. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Just one brief comment. Uh, in response to what Mr. Dale, Dale said, that he believes what we should be looking at is what is necessary to restore the buffer. That is what the uh, regulations require us to do, and that is what the landscape architect's drawing completely addresses. Uh, the numbers that Metro has talked to us about, they start out with 777, they were at 357, they were at 238. And we don't know where the numbers are coming from. And then today we hear, you know, 107, uh, 107 trees, 89 trees. The numbers are just all over the place for us. And we've always said, he's always said that his drawing provides the maximum opportunity to restore that stream buffer. And that's what we were looking at. And that's what our decisions have been based upon. All right, thank you, Mr. Johnson. So in response to that. Uh, okay. You ready? Okay. So um, that's what I said, and I, I, I fully um, think that's the right way to look at this. I think the urban forester just looks at it as the, number, the, the amount of tree calipers that were lost, okay? And he wants to replace that. And it, to me, it's a separate issue. So um, earlier, uh, you had mentioned that this is the first time you'd heard about compromises. Is that correct, more or less? Yes. Yes. And I wonder maybe there's an opportunity to take your plan, your restoration plan, and, and maybe with the direction or encouragement of us to have Metro Stormwater look at that and ensure that that does do what needs to be done. I'm not expert at this. I couldn't tell whether your plan does that or not. Dodd probably can't. I can't. But I wonder if there might be an opportunity for you to go back to staff, work with them on the restoration plan, and maybe even look at the uh, construction plans for Nonsville Pike to make sure that there's no uh, encroachments or anything as far as that's concerned, just take a little bit more time. And I think that you'll probably have a pretty good result. So that would be my suggestion. Um, excuse you, me Mr. one Dale. minute. I wanted to put something up here. And mm -hmm. I apologize if you guys did not see this email. But this is the email that our department sent to them on December 18th, including both the 75% survivability compromise and the total number of inches compromise. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that had been submitted to them. But maybe, maybe they, they didn't get the email. I'm not thank, sure. Uh, thank you, Ms. Dahl. Yeah, I, I, I don't think any of us interpret any malicious intent on your part or staff's part. Uh, you know, uh, frankly, you know, when you see a legal statement that says an appeal to an adverse decision, you're automatically going to be affected by the word adverse if you're on either side of that yes. equation. So <laughs> tensions are going to rise real fast, and I think everybody's trying to, to be their best person here today. So let me, let me see if I can summarize this and help move us along. I think Mr. Dale's suggestion is, is excellent, frankly. And, uh, but um, um, this might put it in perspective. You know, urban environments and our creators' environments will often come in conflict with each other. Okay. And um, landscape, landscape architects typically are asked to manage an urban environment with natural creation features. Our role in protecting these buffers is essentially an effort to protect creation's natural ability to filter and clean our water yes. so we don't have to spend as much money at the drinking water plant, you know, to, to have water to drink. And secondly, to um, buffer floods, to help people downstream get a little bit lower flood peak. We can't eliminate floods because they are natural, but we can reduce those peaks. And then we have things like species that have been created in creation that we don't want to lose. Uh, there are some species out there that provide 
cures for cancer and that provide beauty and that provide diversity uh, for food webs that keep us as a species healthy and happy in this world. So we've got a system here that's in conflict between urban and creation natural that we're trying to work with. Our job is to lean more towards the natural side. Just to put this in perspective, the reason I asked about the linear feet distance is uh, you probably have heard of Lipscomb University where I work. Uh, our elementary school, our academy, which is a private school, which functions like a private business that doesn't have to pay shareholders. We're a nonprofit, but we still have to make more, more money than we spend. We have restored a stream in our playground in the backyard that the children ask be named on federal maps. It now has an official name. We planted 400 trees and about 75 linear feet. So if you double that, 150 feet. It looks pretty nice. It's, it's in a, a private campus, so it has to fit that urban dynamic. But because we're trying to, as a faith-based institution, we're trying to mimic, um, I think it's, uh, if you'll forgive me for a minute here, I gotta refer to this because I, I'm getting old and I can't remember things. We're trying to mimic, um, Jeremiah 17, 8, they shall be like trees planted by a bank. So since we're trying to demonstrate our beliefs and ecological richness, we planted a pretty high density to bring back the ecological diversity, and we were able to kind of come up with something that I think represented both worlds really well. So, you know, we've learned that these types of decisions are best made in collaboration and in reconciliation with each other outside of this discussion. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I think Mr. Dell has made a great suggestion. If, if any of that helps you all uh, in consideration of how to go back and work out a uh, better compromise, we'd be happy to have you do that rather than to prescribe it for you. Because typically we have to rely upon Metro Council's desires in the ordinance and our staff's understanding of what ecological integrity looks like. And they've compromised the ordinance quite a bit based upon what they've shown you today. So, so would you all like to respond to that? I think, I think that's a, a, an excellent suggestion that we uh, take some time to uh, visit with Metro again and see if we can compromise. As we said, we, this is news to me about the 89 or, or reduce, reduction from 357 inches down to 267 inches. That gives us something to work with. Yeah, you're working with a thousand linear feet, so yes. there's, there's a lot of room there to, yes. to, to work together. Okay. Yes. If I can add to that too, I think the precedent is what we're wrestling with is that, like you said, because it came from Auburn Forester, is really a calculation. It was a number, for, it was an apples for apples calculation. Okay. And, and at the end of the day, because I would say I'd like to see what you did over at Lipscomb Elementary, but because the church has been maintaining that area, there is a level of, of reality about maintaining it. Going, if, if, we, if we cut down everything we planted because the guy didn't realize it was even there, that we really didn't do anything. Yeah, and, so, and then the fact that I think that we wrestled with the fact that shrubbery is not included in that calculation, which shrubbery can be a very part, very much a part of that restoration process and the grasses that would be included, which are all expenses to the church. Those were, there was no credit given to those things because it really wasn't a caliper inch calculation quanti quantification. So I think that would be, if, if we could maybe remove the precedent where caliper inches is not what we're trying to figure out how to restore, but we're actually trying to restore a creek bank. That may change a little bit of the dynamic of what the end product looks like. But I don't think Storm would have the flexibility to, to, to include the grasses and include the, the shrubbery as a result of the, just the way the metrics are working. It always came back to inches, and I'm not sure if that's really the end product we're looking for. Okay, that sounds great. So is, you know, I, I don't know that we're inclined to, uh, to grant a variance on traditional tools of measurement, but I'll, I'll open it up to the commission to address that point. But, uh, but it sure would be a lot easier if you all could go work that out sure. amongst Good. yourselves. Let, let me ask Mr. Minshew, what do, do we, let me ask Mr. Minshew, do we, do we then just need to request a continuance to give us an opportunity to work this out and then come reset it for another day? I, I think legal will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the, the suggestion is that you would request a deferral to work with staff and coming up with a compromise. Yes. She's nodding her head. That's yeah. a good sign. I know, Carrie. 
Yeah, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, if I might. Yes. Um, we feel like we've had a, a very long and detailed uh, interaction with Lake Providence, and, and everybody's operating in good faith. Yes. We are looking at this more as a buffer restoration. I think they're probably looking at it a little bit as a landscape plan. Um, we certainly can continue to work with them, but I would just say that the reason we got to a point of suggesting they come to the committee because we felt like they were at a point that it was beyond what staff could approve as a buffer restoration plan, given where the trees were taken down, the impact, the benefit of those trees. So if the committee has any guidance they want to give us, how we reconcile the fact we felt like we got to a final point, of compromise uh, versus what's left to meet in the middle here, we'd surely appreciate that. Okay, I, I think it's fair to say the ordinance contemplates an ecological styled buffer, but Mr. Dale, do you want to? Well, I mean, I think that the committee's been very clear. We're looking at this as a restoration. Not, I don't think we're looking at it as a replacement, okay? So exactly, that's exactly this, this how is, we To me, is a restoration, and I even hate to use the word compromise. It's like a collaboration. I mean, I think everybody has proper intent I know staff's worked very yes. hard on this. I hope they're not upset by anything we're talking about, but I just think that this is the way it needs to be done. It's a yes. restoration. It's not a replanting of trees all across your campus. I don't see that. Urban Forester may have a different view of that. I don't know if you've been cited by codes for any, has, has codes cited them for removal of trees? Is there anything? Any violation or anything been filed as far as from a code's perspective? Other than the non-compliance that so, that so I think I think we're codes. solely working with, with with stormwater, and I see it as a restoration project that I know you can work with them and, and come up with a good product. Yeah, and let me just assure let me just assure the committee that that's exactly from from the first day we met with <coughs> Metro <coughs> when they left the church. Pastor, myself, Mr. Roundtree, and other members of the church got together and we identified this This is what they want. They want us to restore that buffer and that is our main objective. And we think that his plan uh, achieves that. So it's, it, yes. it's not a landscape plan for us. It's uh, how do we restore this buffer? So, uh, yeah. And secondary, you know, yeah. We want some aesthetics out of it as well. Okay. And I, I think all of you, I, I was very impressed with your awareness of endangered species in the creek. The fact that you initiated to contact uh, the state and the federal authorities and, and, you know, government's a complicated place. And the one person you don't call is one person that you get in trouble with, seems yes. like. So, <laughs> so, I, so I guess we need a motion for deferral. All right. I, I, I'd like, Mr. Chair, I'd like to ask okay. a question. Mm -hmm. Uh, to clarify some things here. If we look back at staff, thank you for sharing the emails and the timeline. That was helpful. Um, the email that contained the, was it the second compromise? Was it the final? Where we had discussed the 75% survivability, which allowed for a reduction in tree count to uh, 89, a count of 89, three inch, and 100, or, or 107 two and a half. That was in December of 2020. M Mr. Sandu, let me, let me just address that briefly. That, that was never put in that email. If you'll see that email, the total inches that they're asking for in, in the chart there, 357. That's 238 trees. We, we asked them directly that day by email and by telephone, are you, are you, is it concrete? You want us to do 238 trees no matter what? They told us, yes, 238 trees, 357 inches. Today is the first day that we have seen a compromise recommendation of reduction from 357 to 267 inches. That is the first time we, we have seen this today. Okay. And, they, and there was never any, any any, if you read the email, you don't see 89 in there. You don't see 107 in there. That's the last email we got from them. And they said to us, either do this or go ahead and apply for an appeal with the Stormwater Committee. And that's what we did. I just want to make sure that we have a short meeting on this next time if we do defer, that their action items moving forward are to revise the plan to represent the last compromise that we reviewed together in this committee, and we'd come back, I'm assuming we, we, we would come back, and we would grant approval for that being the variance. 
I, I, I don't know that that necessarily has to happen since this is a, an appeal of an adverse decision. If, if they go and resolve it and choose not to come back, I don't think we'll hear it again. Am I correct in that assumption? Okay, so we're, we're not deferring this. We are denying their request, essentially. Um, is that correct? That, that it could go that way, too, yes. I mean, they can withdraw it, and we can codify that in a deferral uh, or a, a, a statement of opinion by this committee or... The posture of this one is a little confusing because it sort of comes before you uh, for two different things. Um, one was an appeal of a notice of noncompliance, um, you know, the, the basically... When a notice of noncompliance is issued, staff recommends um, certain steps that can be taken to ameliorate that noncompliance. Um, if, if all of that is just complied with, then it never comes before this committee. Um, if, if, you know, if, the, if those steps are not taken to staff satisfaction, then it can be appealed to this committee. The other, and the other, and that's abnormal. Y'all don't usually hear that type of appeal. Um, the variances are the thing that you all do um, most consistently, um, although the other is very much a function of the committee as well. Um, and I think a variance is also being requested here, if I understand correctly, um, that basically we're also in a posture where um, staff is disagreeing with um, the applicant that the um, proposed plan would be in compliance with the stormwater management manual regulations? Um, I, I think generally speaking, and staff can correct me if I'm wrong, but the thought on this was there was a past variance for this site buffer that set out the specific criteria to which they could manage the buffer. In going out and clearing the trees as they did, they, in essence, needed a new standard on that variance, which was part of why, if we couldn't come to an agreement on the regulatory end, that we felt they needed to come back to the committee and, in F essence, get a new variance in place, setting the new standard so that in five years more impacts wouldn't be made. But I think that was maybe in trying to reconcile the two issues. At the end of the day, I think we need, or, or the site would need a new variance set of conditions for the site, given that the trees have yeah, so under fraud. Michael's right. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I, he's redirecting me to something I was forgetting, which was the 2002 variance, and the fact that you know that the 2002 variance was needed in the first place and had specific conditions of compliance in in its terms. Um, you know, if if the current situation is is not in compliance with the terms of the 2002 variance and the conditions on that variance, then, then yes, that, that would be a problem as well. So um, that's almost a, a show cause motion. Sometimes This is not the situation where that would be the case. Normally we have, um, this has come before you a couple of times before, but um, often in situations where people are really defiant and um, uh, but in theory, um, the concept being that um, that if the conditions of the original variance are not met, that the variance is potentially subject to revocation um, and uh, after hearing. Um, and um, so uh, another way to handle that would just be to amend the variance um, and to, to respecify what conditions would currently apply. So I guess that could be yet a third posture <laughs> of which this could be before you. And, and, and I, I have might, a question uh, for Lee. Uh, can you hold just a minute, sure. please? I, I was just going to add, getting back to Mr. Dale's comment, Staff is always kind of in a gray area when they're dealing with these sorts of things about what do they have the authority to approve versus what something when in conflict with the manual needs to get committee approval. And while I certainly understand it's a tall order to meet the number of caliper inches that were out there, that was the variance condition. So as we were calculating inches and even when we were, were kind of ratcheting that back given some of the circumstances, that was the perspective that we were working from. And, and when it got to a point seeing the direction they wanted to go, it just it really seemed like that, that the best option might be to come to the committee and get a reset on their variance, given the fact those trees were taken down 
and their desires at this point in time, given the various circumstances. So just to explain kind of why we started with the caliper inches, that was the condition of the variance that was issued. So we didn't feel like staff had the wherewithal to just approve a landscaping plan for the site that was drastically less than that. Yeah, I, I, it, you know, I haven't heard anyone yet say they're willing to compromise on the caliper inches. And, you know, based on what I mentioned to you all earlier about the standard for ecological restoration, we're way below that standard with what they have recently compromised to give you. So, you know, we can, we can make a decision today that the latest compromise is it. Uh, but if you want to take that compromise and rearrange the details but stick to the caliper inches that they propose and just rearrange the way you distribute it, you know, we can defer and have you come back or we can decide it today. I, I yeah. think it's both. I, I, I think yeah. what, what legal counsel has, has recommended here, correct me if I'm wrong, if we are able to reach a compromise, then that compromise can constitute the amendment to the variance. Am I right about that? That's it. That's exactly right. Yeah, and that's why the deferral was really reissued needed. and revised amendment yes. um, to the 2002 variance. So yes. basically, the conditions could be slightly different, um, but but it would be um, essentially a redo of, of that 2002 variance. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, okay. So so since we're right about that, then back to your suggestion, Mr. Galbraith. Then what we would do um, it, it is reach a compromise with them or, or to defer this in, in terms of so that there won't be a ruling today. Yeah. Uh, we could talk to them and see if we can come up yeah. with a compromise of the, you know, between the 267, 357 or whatever our inches are and reach a caliper inch that everybody is in agreement to, yeah. in agreement with. And then that itself, once we come back or let the committee know, then that could be the basis for the amendment of the variance. Am I right about that? So yes, it, it would have okay. to come before the committee because only yeah. the committee can amend its yeah. prior variance okay. issue. But I, I think you'll have a lot more successful outcome if you'll stick to the minimum compromise that they've given you. If, if I can add something, because there were, there, the two things were confusing, and what, what was lacking in the whole process is the existing conditions prior to the event that took those trees down. I, I, you know, I, I think it's already been explained, and I, I, I apologize for not doing this earlier, but, you know, when you have a variance and the conditions change on the site, you know, you end up having to renegotiate details. So I, I would encourage you to kind of stay sure. in the present on, and right. stay focused on the fact that we got to get back to the original variance conditions, that means we got to replace inches, and anything you do above that would be great for your mission and and uh, and for your community. Can I have one more item of clarification just so we don't, the, I think the thing that was said that would really confuse us was they said you can make it up anywhere on the property, those caliper inches, and because uh, we're a standby parking lot and they said you could put a tree here on the parking lot. And so all of a sudden, we, I got confused as a landscape artist going, what's the objective? You know, if the objective is to restore the bank, and then we have to replace caliper inches, but we can do it anywhere on the property. Is that, I think that's a clarification we need to make sure that, our, and I think Stormwater probably needs that too. If it's, if it, if when it gets down again, caliper inches is what we're talking about, but if it talks about anywhere on the property, we're, we didn't quite understand that direction. I, 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 you know, my, because, I I'm, because, I, because I've got gray hair and have seen a few of these things, I, I can tell you that, and having, I worked for the state for 13 years, having been in their position, you know, we're just desperate to try to give you a solution and give you lots of options, and sometimes that comes across as confusion when all we're really trying to do is just give you lots of flexibility and options sure. to try to work it out within your site. Mm -hmm. But it's way better if you put it all on the creek. It's way better for creation. It's way better for your mission. Mm -hmm. It's way better for your community. Sure. Right. Mr. Chairman, I, I could give them a little bit more guidance on that. Rebecca, our sustainability Can, can you do that offline? Into... Uh, yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I think we've discussed this pretty thoroughly. So all right. it's my job to protect everybody's time once we've discussed it thoroughly. So. All right. So any other objection? Just one point of clarification. Can you sum the posture of where we are then what, so we'll know what to do from here? We know we're going to get with Metro for to try to work something out, but then do we need to refile? 
it, 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 I think we need a motion for deferral, and, and our directive to you is to stick with the minimum. I'll, I'll just go ahead and make a motion that we defer for 30 days, that you not come back to us with anything less than what staff has most recently proposed, and if you can do more, it'd be greatly appreciated. That's my motion. I second. I second. Our motion's motion. been made and properly seconded. Is there any other discussion? All right, seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Seeing none. All right, motion passes unanimously. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. okay, so we're going to take about a five-minute break, if that's appropriate, so we have members who can take a quick bathroom break. So we'll reconvene in about five minutes. with billable time and lives and we're all paid amazing benefits which I think equal zero <laughs> as volunteer public servants but we we signed up for this they didn't so we said yes I'll serve okay so I assume we'll start the recording when we're officially ready to go so we don't we don't have all that on tape Okay, this is our uh, second call to order for the May 2021 Stormwater Management Committee meeting. Uh, our case number two is 2021-00004, the farm at Natchez Trace, 9479 Highway 96. So at this time, I'll invite our staff to uh, make the appropriate legal and, and technical introductions. The opening statement to the applicant. If you are not satisfied with a decision made by the Stormwater Management Committee, you may appeal the decision by filing for a writ of certiorari with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the committee's decision. You are advised to seek the independent advice of legal counsel to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been satisfied. All right, Mr. Mishu. Thank you, Chair. Uh, case number 2021-00004, the farm at Natchez Trace at 9479 Highway 96. Uh, it's Council District 35, Councilman uh, Rosenberg. Uh, it's parcel number 178-00003400. The case description, given, given some confusion regarding the size grading permit related buffer, buffer provisions, the site was found to be mowing a no disturbed area of their buffer as a normal course of site maintenance. Uh, and this was during a stormwater control measure inspection. The variance request is to allow the following, uh, stream buffer disturbance and continuous mowing and maintenance of the buffer. Uh, we did not receive any comments back from codes, public uh, codes, greenways or planning. Thank you, sir. Does that conclude all of our introductory statements? For the staff, Mr. Chairman. Yes, um, sir. I'm actually making the staff comments. I on think, this sir. Today, you are duly of, uh, recognized. Thank you, sir. <laughs> uh, by some circumstance of COVID, and uh, uh, Mr. Tom White is an acquaintance of the owner, and he's familiar with the Stormwater Management Committee process. I asked Mr. Mishu and myself to meet out there and try to figure out what happened on this this site and what's going on. Uh, it, it's an unusual site with some unusual circumstances. Um, so I'm gonna try to very briefly uh, go over what we have. Uh, first of all, the plan on this, well, let me go back. The bottom line on this site is there's some historical usage of what was a phase or a zone one buffer on this site that the owner was unaware once they developed the site would need to end. So instead of letting the, that area grow up, there's been some periodic uh, mowing and weed eating in this area because it is a use area for the ongoing operations of this farm. So that's kind of the bottom line of what they're looking at today. Staff was out at the site, discovered in seeing some buffer signs that it was being maintained. 
So when we started working with the site, and this is a site plan that was approved, I think it was a 2014 plan, uh, you can see the stream buffer highlighted, and then above the zone one designation there highlighted in yellow, you can see a walking path that's sort of at the heart of some of this. Um, the, the building for this particular grading permit is sort of up in the upper right-hand corner. It's a, it's a new building. Uh, that they put in, and in looking at this, the owner, I, I guess, and, and she can elaborate, felt it was a during the project no disturbance, so later on mowing after the fact, she felt she, she wasn't aware. So hopefully that's a lot clearer on plans now for folks, but at the time uh, that was something that she, um, she sent. So we've been out to the site a couple of times to, to look at what's going on, and they are indeed... Um, mowing that zone one buffer. Rebecca, if you could go through that presentation a little bit. So that's a zoom in. You can see the top of bank. We're a little bit, we think maybe there's been a new uh, floodplain put on this property since the uh, grading permit went through. Uh, and we're also not exactly sure, you know, why the buffers were laid out the way they were. But this shows the site up to the upper left is about, I believe, five acres of pasture that they have that runs into that area. It's not mowed all the time, but mowed on some frequency. Um, that all ends up routing through this ditch, which is the outfall shown here. Um, and, and the facility uses that area as a walkway from time to time uh, as, a, as part of their operation. And when we went out there and discussed all the options, um, it, it was to them necessary that they continue to have some maintenance in this area. And so that's when we worked with them about coming in to try to secure a variant. So if you want to go forward a little bit, that sort of overlays the site with the, um, with, uh, with the plan. Was there one more, Rebecca, or was that it? And could you bring up the photos, and I'll kind of set the stage for Ms. Barnstead to go over what she's going to talk about. So this is what we're, we're looking at. Um, there's a lower shelf right there that I would imagine when we have flooding conditions, the water gets up into. Um, it's, um, it's kind of the type of area that you would see. And you can see the mature trees in this area uh, probably gets a lot of rushing water through there. On the upper left-hand corner, there is an abandoned road, I guess, when this facility was bought, there was an abandoned road that ran parallel to the creek that's since been taken out. And there is some grass over that area now. You can still see a little bit of pavement. Um, and so what the applicant is looking to do, they have a, a dog or a pet border business, and they do take the animals down this path at some times. Obviously, that was a concern to us, uh, but it was related to us that they have an a condition of employment policy that any anyone found not picking up after a dog is terminated. So um, that that's it in a nutshell. Um, they're wanting to continue to, I guess, utilize this area has been utilized for for some time, and uh, they put a mitigation plan together and are here before you today to re basically reset the buffer for this site. All right. Thank you, Mr. Hughes. Uh, all right. So um, at this time, we'd like to open it up for our applicant for a 10-minute summary or less. And uh, after that, just so you know the process, uh, we'll open it up for any kind of public response for and against. And then we'll close the public hearing, and then the commission members will debate and probably ask you questions. So welcome. And if you'll introduce yourselves and push the little red button, uh, that'll help us a lot. Thank you. Hi, my name is Linda Burnsed, and I'm the owner of the farm at Natchez Trace. Uh, as he mentioned, it's a pet resort is what we call it in the industry. So you can all chuckle behind your mask. Um, so we, we care for um, dogs and cats. Um, when I bought the property, it was about in 1999, I think, um, I was looking to, to, to do a boarding facility where there was acreage. Um, most boarding facilities are in commercial zoning and you don't have a lot of space. And if you're a dog lover, you like to throw a tennis ball and the dog be able to run. And so it's kind of an unlikely place to have a boarding facility out on Highway 96 West, but that was the reason. And the, there was an old farmhouse that was built in 1910 
and an old barn. And you'll see both of those on the, the plan. The farmhouse is the first building you come to. So we maintain those. Uh, we now use that farmhouse as our administrative offices. Uh, and we, we built the new facility there, which is the larger one there in the center of the picture. And when we bought it, the driveway was actually an abandoned road. It was the road that existed prior to new Highway 96. So it's asphalt, but deferred maintenance asphalt, you know, cracked and, and, and so forth. Um, and that went the entire length of what we're speaking of now. So we've got pea gravel. We didn't, we didn't bring asphalt in when we um, put in our driveways to the facility. But you can see from 96, you've got uh, pea gravel and then a circular drive into the main building. And then what this is talking about is all the way at the end, the new building, we built a wolf club barn uh, for our daycare, uh, dog daycare. And so from that point down, there's, um, we closed the road. This was before even the Wolf Club. We stopped any use of that road ourselves uh, with any, b before they use farm equipment, things like that. And we stopped using it for any reason. And, and we closed off the end on Little East Fork with a gate so that there could be no traffic going back and forth. So we were trying to maintain that area specifically <coughs> to be natural and um, the creek and the trees and all of that. The dogs come and you pick a package. Again, I, I always have to, people roll their eyes when I'm talking about my business, but you, you're, you purchase a package for your dog. And if you're on the like dog who thinks he's a human package, uh, it means you're not compatible. And so all of your activities are one-on-one -on -one. and we call it the nature trail. And so we take the dog on a walk uh, the whole property I own is 18 acres, but the area we're talking about down there is just about four or five acres. Um, but they put on a slip lead, they put on a harness, and we take them on what we call a nature walk. And literally, it is just walking along the path that already re existed. There was a path there that I don't know how long it had been there forever along the creek. And then you circle back up and you walk back towards the facility on this abandoned road. The abandoned road sits significantly higher than, than the trail. Um, but the abandoned road sits higher than the pasture land. So in reality, uh, water isn't coming from the pasture land like over the roadway and down. Instead, when we built the Wolf Club uh, barn, they required we put in some swales and a culvert. Uh, I may be using the wrong term, but but a place for, for water in the pasture to go into, and then that water goes under the abandoned road. So what we've done is uh, after the 2010 flood and all those things, uh, we actually reseeded that abandoned road, and it's now pretty much all grass. There's some patches of asphalt in between, but, but it's, uh, so that's something that we did without requirement, but, but it has really helped that from the standpoint of having filtering and those things. So in reality, water doesn't come from the pasture land over that. And I think you've got an engineering report from, from GAM in engineering in there. Um, but with respect to the, to the mowing, we do mow. So that is, that's our bad, as they say. I didn't realize we were uh, not able to continue mowing. Um, uh, and so we have continued to mow that. But its only use is for a human to walk a dog, um, as, as Mr. Hunt mentioned. We have a strict policy about picking up feces the moment it occurs. So our handlers all have to carry what we call poop bags in their uh, pocket, have to have one at all time, and the moment a dog uh, does defecate, they, they pick it up at that. And that's not true just on the trail, that's in the whole facility in our play fields. Um, that, that's pretty much it. We, we, uh, we're all about eliminating erosion and all of those things because, I mean, the creek is on our property, so we deal with that and watch that. And, and after the 2000 flood, when the waters, when it rains a lot, I'm the one watching to see where that water's coming to. So we have proposed um, I, I guess as a compromise or a variance is that we'll be allowed to continue to mow that and use it for walking only. Um, but we'll also add some plantings and all. Um, and that's where Mr. Hebert um, has proposed some uh, plantings. 
to, to make it even better. You, that, that's all I've got. Okay, thank you, Linda. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, my name is Skip Hebert. I'm a landscape architect uh, with Hebert Ball Land Design uh, in Franklin, and I was brought into the project several months ago. Um, we've had uh, several meetings, uh, both on site and by, by phone calls with uh, Mr. Mishu and with Mr. Hunt, uh, and we've tried to come up with some some mitigation measures that would help uh, offset, you know, the, allowing us to um, to be able to mow the that area under a continuous mowing uh, variance. Um, a couple of the things, the, the plan that was submitted and the plan that is before you um, has several mitigation notes and I'll bring those up. The first in, uh, that we have is soil and, and turf has been installed over that existing road as, as Linda said. Um, before that road probably uh, had probably 95% runoff. Uh, and there's, and as she also mentioned, there's not a tremendous amount of runoff in that area, but that was impervious area. Um, the, the replacement with the turf uh, has helped to, to slow down, obviously, that, uh, that runoff and to uh, let some of that water to infiltrate into the back into the ground. Um, the detention pond that was installed during the construction of the barn uh, already provides some natural infiltration. Um, it was designed as a detention basin. It wasn't a true bio pond, uh, I don't believe, and, and it has uh, a, a culvert, and you see that on the plan as well that runs from the center of the uh, detention basin uh, out to uh, the stream bank, which is probably about eight, eight feet, seven or eight feet from the, the actual uh, stream, uh, edge of stream. Um, what we are proposing is on the upper side of that culvert is to add a small area for some bioretention as well, uh, adding plantings in there, adding some shrubs and adding a tree. Uh, that would help uh, absorb some of that moisture, uh, some more additional amount of that moisture before it is allowed to drain out into the creek uh, or and down into the stream itself. Um, the uh, third item that we have for the mitigation is indigenous species have been planted at both the inlet uh, of the pond or at the inlet of the, of the bio pond, uh, and that provides, again, some additional infiltration uh, of the runoff. Um, we're putting river rounds on the uh, inlet of that culvert as well as the outlet of that culvert uh, to hope to serve as several purposes. One is to, to slow the energy uh, down as an en energy dissipator so that uh, the water coming out of the, uh, the culvert is going to be at a slower rate than if it just flowed directly into the stream. Uh, it would also help reduce any erosion at that point. It also serves as uh, somewhat of a filter to, <coughs> excuse me, to absorb um, some of the, you know, any debris that might be in that bio pond, uh, grass clippings and things like that. So it would, would help slow down the, the water getting into the pipe. Um, we've added additional indigenous plantings along the stream bank to provide uh, additional filtration. Right now, the stream bank is 375 feet long. Uh, that we're the area that we're dealing with. And in that 375 tr feet, there are 52 existing trees. We're not touching any of those existing trees. All of those will remain, all the root systems will remain intact. We're not disturbing in any of that area with the exception of any pits that we've had to dig to put shrubs in. Um, <clears throat> we are not proposing trees in that area because of the number of existing trees uh, that are already there. Um, if, you, if you use the math that, that I gave you of the, the 52 trees in 375 feet, uh, that's approximately, if it, they were evenly spaced, uh, that would be one tree every 7.2 feet, just a lower seven feet, you have a tree. Uh, now, since they aren't all equally spaced, I, I did a, just a quick study to see what the maximum distance between any two trees in that 375 feet length are. Uh, and the maximum distance between any trees at that point are 20 feet. And if we were doing a stream mitigation plan, uh, the 20 feet would probably be, be about the limit uh, to go much uh, closer than that. Uh, the trees are going to start, start growing together, and eventually they're going to crowd each other out. Um, so we, we feel that the existing trees provide uh, a very good uh, a buffer as far as stabilization for the creek and absorption of moisture that's infiltrated into the uh, into the uh, the soil in that area. So we're proposing shrubs in that area, um, and I apologize, I don't have the total number of shrubs, but on the plant schedule, uh, we are proposing shrubs, and we're 
trying to propose them in the areas where there are gaps between the trees. Uh, as you saw from some of the photographs that staff showed you, there are a number of trees or a number of groupings of trees where there are four or five, six trees in a cluster of maybe 10 feet. Um, and what we're trying to do is where it spaces out, where we've got that 20 foot gap, is to try to fill that in with shrubs. Uh, and we feel the shrubs will provide a quicker um, uh, growth rate. They will can get to some size that, that will uh, provide, uh, again, a, a stronger root system uh, to augment what is there already there with the existing trees. So with that, that's uh, essentially the mitigation measures. We had six different mitigation measures that I just mentioned uh, that we feel aid in um, slowing the runoff and reducing the runoff uh, that we currently have. Thank you. Right, thank you. Does that conclude your remarks? Okay. All yes, right. Sir. At this time, we'll uh, open up the uh, public hearing. Uh, is there anyone here who would like to comment uh, in favor of the current applicant's proposal? All right. Seeing none. Uh, anyone here who would like to speak uh, against the uh, current variance proposal? All right. Seeing none. So at this time, uh, I'd like to ask if we have any emails or any other comments that have been submitted. No, sir. All is quiet on this one. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we enjoyed that a little too much there in that moment, I think. So, All right, so, so we, we don't have any emails or letters or comments. And uh, so at this time, I'll close the public hearing and open it up for the... Uh, committee's uh, remarks and questions. I want to apologize to Mr. Hunt for getting his name wrong earlier. <laughs> I had a senior moment, called him by somebody else's last name. So y'all might not even, well, have I even noticed I answered, that. So I guess it wasn't too bad. <laughs> yeah, that's, it started with an H. <laughs> all right. So that's some, some days that's all I can do is get the first letter right. So uh, does anybody, uh, would anybody like to ask the applicants anything? All right, so while y'all are thinking, I'll, uh, I'll ask staff, um, how far off is their proposal from ours? Well, I, I don't know that we had a proposal. Uh, part of the uniqueness of this one is that there is such a mature tree canopy over this. Um, I know when we did go out and, and try to listen to what some of the proposals were, they're very limited as far as where certain things can go which is why I think you saw the, the shrubs being used in this instance. It's a unique situation and, and different from some others where there's nothing and you need that tree canopy. Um, I think what we just basically asked them to do is come in with their best effort, uh, given all the circumstances out there, and that's what they did. So it sounds like it kind of boils down to the fact that the new development triggered the no mowing requirement and they're wanting to mitigate the no mowing requirement by adding native understory bioretention. It's basically a mow and maintain. So, so how do you all feel about that? Well, you, you know, it, every site is unique. So I know we tend to want to look at things globally. This, this probably would be inadequate as far as mitigation on some sites, but when you take this in totality and you look at this stream and you look at what this particular area would be if it was left undisturbed, um, I think it makes this much more in line with being equal or greater offset. It's always better to leave it undisturbed. There's no doubt about that. Uh, as I mentioned, we had some concerns about the pets, but I know in the times I was out there and, and Mr. Mishu was out there too, I never saw any sign of any impact from pets um, or any remnants of, of any pet presence. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we try to look at things you know, on their own merits and the circumstances and, you know, the road used, there used to be a paved road, uh, pasture land up above that, you know, so uh, is it a perfect scenario? No, but um, I, I do think they, they did the best they could with coming in with this particular plan, but obviously beyond what staff can, can approve in this circumstance, so, which is why they're before you. Okay, so just one more clarification for me. Uh, um, so that, it sounds like you want to keep the dog trail on the creek? Yes. Okay. The reason is it's the only offer. Um, that portion of the property we have closed down to street traffic at all, whereas the other portions of the property 
have the drive, the pea gravel drive. And so for safety reasons, for our staff, for the dogs, for the dogs not getting agitated by cars driving by and those types of things, it's the area um, where we can safely walk the dogs down and back. It's like a 15 minute circle. It's, it's the same thing. And, um, and it's not all the dogs. You have to pick that package that has a nature walk on it. Some dogs do group play, some do wolf clubs. Some, we have large, three large play fields where we do the fetching and all of that. All this is for is for the dogs who are not compatible to play with other dogs to be able to take them on a walk by themselves. One person, one dog. And, um, and so that's, that's the area we've done it for. Uh, we celebrate our 17th anniversary in February. We've been open 17 years. And so for 17 years, we've been walking dogs down there and back. And um, it, it, would, it would be pretty impactful if we were unable to do that, because that's one of the things of reasons people choose our company over another one is because their dogs have space and nature and real grass instead of fake grass. And um, so we're, we're meticulous in our maintaining of the property. And um, if you do allow us to continue to use it as a walking path, the reason this option versus just letting the weeds grow is ticks and snakes and things like that, if you just let weeds grow, um, are, are potential. Um, all, along the creek and along the path. So mowing it keeps it safe. Um, and like I said, we've never seen any runoff or erosion problems. I mean, literally never seen it because they, the pasture land and it goes under the road. But um, nevertheless, we understand that that's, that's the requirement. And, um, and so uh, we'd like to continue continue. That's a long way to answer your question. We would like to continue to use that That's okay. Area. We, we, we get a lot of that here. A simple so. yes would have done, wouldn't it? <laughs> it, yes. it, it goes yeah. with the benefit yeah. package. Sorry so. about that. Sorry. So the, so the, um, um, so it, well, am I misunderstanding, but why can the pea gravel drive not become the replacement for the trail next to the creek? Isn't it parallel to that portion of the trail? You, you mean for walking purposes? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The pea gravel drive is the driveway. It's mm -hmm. where cars drive. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you bring your dog in and you take your dog home, that's literally the driveway. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so that can't be the, where you go on the nature walk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I guess my, my concern is, is you, know, um, you know, the requirements have functions and values. So, so we're a little more focused on what the public is benefiting from by having a, a dense, healthy buffer. Um, it, well, you know, roots allow soil to absorb water like a dry sponge. And anything that doesn't allow roots to penetrate and create friable, porous spaces in soil that are replaced by organic matter that hold water that actually help your trees benefit more during droughts, is is going to create runoff, and and I, I realize you probably you I know you said you haven't seen it, but it, it's definitely there. The it's the most it's the most measurable dynamic on a landscape. Mm -hmm. It's the most easy, easily litigable uh, empirical evidence to provide in court is to show before and after runoff when something has been cleared versus when something is not cleared. I mean the runoff almost triples in most cases uh, right. when you remove trees. And, and replace it with pasture even. The, the runoff is triple from a forest in, in a typical Middle Tennessee kind of environment. So, so, I, so the, the concern is, is that the mitigation, we typically encourage a lot denser mitigation to make up for that type of casual intrusion. I'll, I'll admit it's, it's not a, it's not a uh, Metro has greenways through buffers all the time, and they use pavement, so which is even even worse, right? Uh, but they also let those buffers grow up really densely on both sides of those trails often. So, is there is there any ad, is there any additional bang for the buck you can give us? Because uh, Mr. Hunt very, in many ways, very politely described the situation. I, I don't think I've ever 
changed a diaper that had remnant remnants things associated with it. <laughs> but very very nice choice of words there, Mr. Hunt. But the but the um, the, the the challenge is is, is that uh, um, you know as he said in another site you know we get a lot bigger bang for the function and value and. And, and this helps the community have cheaper drinking water, have, have a little lower flood peaks, have a higher quality, particularly when you add it up all up and down a stream. If we granted a variance like this for every landowner, after the fact, uh, after they did an expansion, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have those benefits. So what are, you, what are you thinking? See, I gave a long answer too. <laughs> oh, yes, absolutely. Um, I probably haven't articulated well, but I, I, I think as a matter of fact, as a factual matter, we have improved the area that's the stream buffer now uh, from when I purchased the property. And we've improved it in two very significant ways. What used to be the old asphalt drive is now a grassy area where there can be no vehicles, nothing other than human traffic, whereas there was mechanical traffic before and it was an asphalt and now it's just this nice green path. The second thing we did is when the new building was built, uh, we put in swales into the pasture land and this whatever you call it, it's not really detention pond, bio, whatever. We, we, put, we put that in so that if there is runoff from the pasture land, um, it filters through and then you know make, makes its way down. So from when I bought the property, it's already been significantly improved to meet the purposes you're speaking of. We've not taken out any trees. We've not taken out any bushes. All we've done is there was where maybe you would have grass and weeds here. We weeded them to here. So, so the plants themselves have not been disturbed. The trail was already there. The roadway was there. We've improved the roadway. So from from what I'm from where I'm standing, we've already taken significant mitigation efforts that we had no, um, I guess, legal obligation to do. And so it's it's almost like this stream buffer situation for us now. Uh, for, again, just in in my view, we're correcting a problem that doesn't exist. We've already done the types of things that someone might come in and say, like, like had you said, okay, you can't have that asphalt road there. You know, you're gonna have to do something. I say, okay, we'll do that. And you can't just have the pasture sitting there. You gotta do something. Okay, we did that. So unrelated to this down non-compliance, we've done all these things and I think it's in really good shape. Um, and, and so I'm happy to, to do more, and I understand what you're saying. I just don't, I don't think we've made the matter worse. We, we, a lot of yeah. people come in with a variance because they've made it worse. I think we've already made it better even yeah. before we came here. So. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I wish we could give you credit for things outside <laughs> of the buffer. I don't get points. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, we, we do appreciate knowing you care that much about it, very, very much so. Okay. Thank I, you, Mr. Chairman. The, there, there were several points that you made in the very good points. Uh, one was about the root systems acting as a sponge, and that is indeed correct. Uh, and one way you get uh, that sponge effect is to have deep-rooted plants. Uh, the best way that I know of as a landscape architect is to use the indigenous species, which we've tried to do. And that was one of the reasons why we use the shrubs, uh, because they do tend to have a more fibrous root system than a woody root system of a, a mature tree. Although mature trees do have the fibrous root systems at the, the ends of the, the root systems. Um, so we feel that you know the we're trying to replace some of those plants that uh, may have been disturbed over the years uh, and add additional plants that would uh, would 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 help mitigate and help absorb some of that plant, not only along the stream bank, but as Linda said, the, uh, in the 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 uh, actual bow or the uh, detention basin, we've created a kind of a a, 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 a a filter at the inlet of the pipe to help and to not only absorb some additional water with the root systems, but to filter out uh, any uh, debris that would come through that culvert. So she's kind of hinted that you might could do something extra. So is there well, that's, else? that's what we feel. We've, we've done the extra with all the shrubs. Uh, but can you propose anything new today in addition to what you um, you're proposing? Other than just more quantity. Um, okay. And I don't, you know, the, it, it, 
I, I think that some more quantity would be fine. We could be happy to work with staff on that. Uh, I, I hesitate to put additional trees in uh, along the creek bank. Uh, okay. And we could. We I think could Mr. Hunt well. agreed with that. I think understory is th the goal here, density of understory. So, do you all have any suggestions? And I, yeah. Yeah, just to clarify one point, you know, traditionally in, in the environmental culture, you know, the, the burden is on the applicant, the polluter pays, you know, all those kind of concepts. So, sure. so typically staff, you know, are, are, are not really allowed to give you too much advice that someone like yourself can provide. But sure. Mr. Hunt, do you have anything that you could well, volunteer? I just, I just wanted to clarify some comments. We did go out there and meet with them to try to give them a little technical guidance on, you know, to facilitate the process. And I think part of, while this isn't what you would say on normal sites, so that's predicated on what the buffer is today. The amount of, under, uh, of trees. And I mean, if you imagine yourself in like a grove of oaks, and imagine what the ground is where there's a lot of shade and whatnot. That's sort of what they're dealing with. The stream bank's in relatively good shape. Um, and in looking at where there were potential platting uh, locales, they were limited in my estimate as far as what was gonna be a successful mitigation plan or addition to that. So um, I, I didn't mean to intimate there was more to be done necessarily, but just that they were limited as far as what their opportunities were, other than the fact they, they still utilize that walkway and they want, as she said, bring down some of the levels of that, that vegetation. Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm unfortunately plagued by the reality that what it is now versus what it could be, as was alluded to earlier, is always on my mind as someone who educates people about this kind of thing professionally. So I'm always going to ask for more. So so I, I'm going to open it up to the committee to see what they think and what they want to do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think it's, I don't know how often I see that, but I'm looking at staff has no comment on their uh, documents that they provided to us. So I really feel like that that's an indication to me that staff's generally okay with this. And I think that they've done more than enough to offset whatever uh, needs to be done. So I'm going to make a motion to approve this application as submitted. Thank you. All right. Do we have a second? second. I've got a motion. Second. All right. Motion to made and probably seconded. Was that you, Mr. Lewis? Yes. I said that. All right. Thank you. All right. We have a motion to second. Is there any discussion? Mr. Chairman, may I ask a question? Yes, sir. Please. Um, I, I know we, we get a lot of these zone one buffer variances at this committee. Is there any uh, quantitative analysis that substantiates a, 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 a direct replacement from, you know, un, an undisturbed buffer to, you know, qualifying some planting schedule? And then I'm assuming that in this staff report, they have approved what's been proposed here. And so that's, that box is checked. Is that an accurate statement. Sorry for my ignorance. No, no, that, that's that's a very appropriate and important question. It it, it highlights something we've discussed. Uh, that there's lots of science on it. There's science that even traces, you know, nitrogen and phosphorus molecules, you know, into buffers and how much nutrients are held by plants that are planted in a certain density of buffers. There's lots of science. Our problem is is that. We've never really codified a specific standard or a density that is related to that science. We've tended to um, um, be a little more subjective about that, like a lot of water quality criteria in Tennessee tend to be, although that's not ideal. Uh, what we try to avoid is being inconsistent in how we do it. We try to think about relative impacts, uh, relative situations. I think Mr. Hunt's probably done a really good job of helping us understand that this is as good as this kind of situation gets uh, in terms of stability. Um, I, I, I think it's also fair to say that that um, um, the applicant can always do more above what we ask you to do um, for your own aesthetic benefit, your own value, your own neighbor's benefit. So, uh, so yeah, it's uh, we're unfortunately kind of stuck with a bit of a subjective <laughs> dynamic, but we're working on a proposal to make it a little more objective. So good. Yeah, yes, just sir. one quick comment. I, I think it's um, important, even though we can't give environmental credits here, to at least give you a pat on the back for covering up the roadbed. Uh, I'm sure if you'd known the outcome, you may have left it. <laughs> but um, at any rate, thank you for doing that. And I think the, the plan leaves the property a whole lot better than it was 20 years ago. Yeah, we, lo we love applicants that come ready to make it better. 
Right. Is that it, Mr. Lewis? I, do I, I have just one curious question. When in our recent rains this past year, we had significant flooding. Where did the water level rise to? Was it? Sorry. This last one was the first time since 2010 that it did go outside of its banks. So t 2010 was the first time I, I bought it in 99. That was the first time. And then this last time um, when there was the reason it wasn't as bad as 2010, but it did go outside of the banks. Which is up to the old road surface yeah. area, essentially. So yes. just again, for my education, mm -hmm. sorry when or if these plantings are, 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 are new and not established and they may get wiped out during an event like that, I guess there's some level of uh, uh, trust that you will be replacing those items that are in this, that we're approving here today, uh, because, you know, beyond today, it's just... Right, right. I mean, I, I would be happy to do that. Yeah. So, right. yeah, I'm all about yep. keeping the bank uh, because I don't want it eroding and killing right. the large mature trees that we have there. And, you know, from 2010, it exposed roots, mm -hmm. you know, like, like it does. Great. But anyway, that, that's the short answer to your yes. question. Yes. The answer is yes, you will replace the plants in the event that they all get wiped out. Absolutely. It, Thank you. Like, sir. Mr. Chairman, uh, yes, yes, I know there's a, a already um, a motion in a second, but may I add something? Yeah, they were in the discussion phase. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, when we did go out there, we did notice that the stream was very functional. We did see a lot of aquatic life. We did um, we did notice that there is it's not listed for any 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 items, whether it's E. coli or anything like that. It's a fully supporting stream. We did notice that the overland flow going uh, through the buffers were a little bit more minimal than more bu uh, the, you know the traditional buffers. So uh, you, you know we we kind of did look at. Um, along with some plantings, which don't quote me on it, I think I counted about 10 shrubs in between the trees. Uh, it, it, seemed, uh, it seemed, at least to me, that there's a little bit more bang for the buck treating some of the up areas prior to getting to the stream, seeing that there wasn't a lot of overland flow, uh, sheet flowing through a traditional buffer system. Thank you, Mr. Mishu. All right, is that it? Any other discussion? All right, I'll just say that I'm going to vote yes in the hope that they're going to do more in the future to make me happy. So, <laughs> all right, so, all, right, so uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right, motion passes. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. So we have got next on the agenda just regular items of business. Um, if I'm looking at the latest agenda, my agenda says state route, or excuse me, SR, Senate Resolution 830338, Resolution Letter, Hickory Hollow Parkway, Linda Kelly, Metro Water. Are we going to have that presentation? All right. Mr. Chairman, while Linda's getting prepared to speak, I'll just remind you that was the large buffer disturbance out in the Hickory Hollow area that the enforcement was uh, remanded to this committee. You issued uh, sort of the compliance schedule and we've been monitoring that site now for several years. And are now to the point of closing it out and Linda's gonna give you a few details on that oh, today. Excellent, we always love insights on what, how good of a job we did. To... I'm sorry? Uh, thank you. Okay. So this um, February 1st, 2017, a, a notice of violation stop work order was placed on this property, which is 5135 and zero Hickory Hollow Parkway. Um, variance request, oh, I'm sorry. So the stop work order was for grading and filling without a permit, inadequate erosion and sediment controls buffer disturbance and clearing of 12 plus or minus acres of property located in the floodway. The um, a variance was granted on an April 6, 2017 hearing with the following conditions. Develop long-term maintenance agreement to achieve forested floodplain, yearly reports of site, site conditions, 
declaration of restrictions and covenants and long-term maintenance plan to be recorded with the register of deeds against the property. Provide a greenways conservation easement along Mill Creek frontage of the property. And then maintain a minimum of 75 survivability of plantings through two growing seasons. Since that time, 1,690 trees have been planted on the property as indicated on page three of the report dated January 15th, 2021. When last inspected in October of 2020, it was determined 75% of planted and volunteer trees remained on site. It was documented that the previously disturbed area is undergoing natural succession and is transitioning back into forested floodplain. The MPDES office is satisfied with the outcome of the restoration process and will close this case, uh, this case upon the successful recording of number three and four above, which is the recording with the register of deeds, the um, greenway conservation and um, long-term maintenance. Okay, is that it? All right, thank you, Ms. Kelly. Mr. Um, Chairman, if, if I might, uh, no. Linda, I don't know that she's been here before, and I'd introduce her uh, to the committee, is our person who investigates grading without a permit concerns. Mm -hmm. So she's a very busy person with our 500 mm -hmm. plus square miles. <laughs> but she is the person that gets all of those calls and follows up on that, and she does a great job for Bless us. Bless you. That's kind of like akin to being yeah. a bill collector. Thank you for your service on that one. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, you're, yeah you're, you, ha you have a much more pleasant demeanor than I expected you to have. <laughs> and, and look a lot healthier and happier than I expected you to, to do, too. That's tough work. I really appreciate that. I remember this project. I mean, the, if you all remember, it was clear cut, and, and I think they even had gone in and ground up everything and left left mulch behind and I, I remember BD, BDY came in and, and that was uh, part of their plant they had to remove a lot of that mulch before yeah. they even could start the yeah, yeah this amazing. is one of the first projects given to me when I came on <laughs> my goodness my goodness how many, how many acres did this end up being rest, restored um I'm sorry to hit you with a question like that but this we have about 1,690 have plants that were planted, looks like. While she's looking that up, I will say, given the fertile nature of this area, there's just been a lot of native uh, yeah. trees and whatnot come up. So that's been a sort of a little bit of a different aspect that maybe we didn't, didn't envision. But when things come up like that, they really grow fast. Yeah, I remember we debated the density of plantings, and I remember that was one of the contingencies that we hoped would offset not having to plant every single plant. Yeah, it is really true. If you if you create an environment, they will come. So, all right, all right. thank you. Appreciate it. Any questions? All right. Thank you very much. All right, so the next item is um, Fontenelle update. Mr. Hunt. One last thing on that I will mention. One of the aspects that's important, and it's the last thing we're closing up now that the plan is finished and we've reported back to you, is to get the restrictive deed and covenant recorded against the property so anyone ever wanting to buy the property will be fully aware that that buffer exists on that property. So um, I guess not long ago, Rebecca, can you pull up the Fontenelle agreement document for members who are not familiar with this uh, this is a recurring issue uh, to so use mr hans gentle terms yes uh 2020 uh is variance 2020 zero 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 fourteen uh, Fontenelle came uh, to the committee uh, under new ownership wanting to modify their buffer usage there on uh, White's Creek that has a very wide flood plain, floodway, floodplain that makes their buffer very wide. Um, 
So if you go to the end of this document, Rebecca, I hate to do this to you, but go to the end and pull up condition nine. There was a condition nine that, that uh, the applicant shall coordinate with stormwater staff on the frequency and duration of events that would utilize parking within the floodplain and floodway stream buffers of Wage Creek. So uh, thank you for this opportunity for excellence, as I refer to. And we have been going back and forth with Fontenelle for some time on this. and. Uh, uh, Rebecca, if you can go back to that document on page one, um, I'll, I'll briefly go over where we settled. Obviously, event is is an, an impact day, and um, these bullets show what is uh, you know if at least one of these it's an impact day. If a vehicle or motorcycle is parked, it's an impact day. Anything over thirty thousand pounds, so even bringing in on a big truck something in there will be an impact day before the actual event. And then anything greater than 10,000 pounds, uh, you know, stages, carnival equipment, that. Now, there is a, a bullet that anything lighter than 10,000 pounds, like certain uh, stages or garden structures or some certain other things, uh, would not count, but those would be limited to three consecutive days so as to not get shade out. The big uh, element in this was 48 impact days. Staff had started at, or 30, 48. Staff had really started at 36, so where we ended up landing was basically one more day a month impact. Um, they did make a comment that there'll be no vehicle or motorcycle parking in field A. When we get to that graphic, I'll show you that. Um, the owner is, per their stormwater management plan that was a part of one of their past variances, be responsible for several things, one of which is siting food trucks and portable toilets on the op outer side of White's Creek. Uh, they're going to record every day, so they've got to be keeping up with how close are they to the 48. And um, we meet, we have set up to meet annually with them to discuss not only this, but also their SCM, stormwater control measure compliance on the site. We have inspectors that now go around to every regulated SCM in Metro and we inspect them periodically. Um, Leah Steinstraw, who uh, spoke earlier, is a member of that group. So she is actually going to be taking this site over. So she'll be monitoring the site and meeting with them annually to make sure this doesn't have impact on the site. Um, hopefully there'll be no issues, but uh, if you scroll to page two, there is a provision that if there are issues, it will be remanded back to the Stormwater Management Committee to review. Uh, hopefully that will not happen, but if we do get out there and see that the 48 days per year is creating issues, that's going to be the, and that was agreed upon between both parties, um, which would, if they agreed with your outcome, they could take it to court. So if you scroll down a little bit more, you will see we attached to the agreement document the stormwater maintenance plan for the site. And this is what we reference when we go to the site. It gives the various ways in which they monitor that area to make sure that the impacts are minimal. There are you know, various things involved with that. They, they monitor those areas to make sure flood events do not impact anything, floatables, uh, just anything that you can think of, staff education. Um, how many trees did you end up with, by the way? Uh, this was, all we were charged with was just getting this agreement as far as the usage of okay. this area. I'm just wondering if that was reflected in the agreement, because I remember we specified, or the applicant offered to up the number of trees. The variance would, it, yeah, whatever was specified in the variance okay. other than this agreement would be. Yeah. Uh, Seems like I remember 401 handled trees. Handled in another. Yeah. Another means. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I pressed them on that quite a bit, so I remember it. So. Uh, section yeah. A is where no motorcycles or vehicles can be parked. And then you can see uh, they divided the site up into several areas. And uh, their contention is this is going to allow them to mix and match and move according to when certain areas are more susceptible or wetter or whatnot. So, um, this is basically going to be the cornerstone of what we'll be looking at. So, uh, we finally came to an agreement. The effective date was May 1st, so going forward on May 1st of every, May Day of every year, we will be monitoring that site. So at this point, we consider that condition met and uh, done. Oh, great job. I know, um, as I was telling Mr. Lewis earlier during the break, you know, we've adopted kind of a policy through um, common law behavior 
uh, for the benefit of our council, of uh, not um, um, enabling conflict, but enabling uh, collaboration. And so we typically um, encourage applicants to go back and work with staff on technical details that can get beyond the prescriptive capacity of a, a group this diverse and, and, and this that is generally focused on more policy matters as opposed to the technical and scientific details. But um, I think you all did exactly what we hoped you'd do, and that's find something that would work. And then it sounds like you got the monitoring in place to, to see if that compromise to go from 36 to one more a month, I think it was, uh, uh, is going to be a good idea or not. We had quite a bit of testimony from people in the community who were concerned about the compaction within the buffer of cars, uh, making the ground less permeable and creating bigger flood peaks in the area, which uh, uh, I think Roger's given us some great summaries of some rain, unique rainfall events that have become more frequent, more intense in that area. So it was a big concern. And, and the plan does so, include some aeration requirements of that area. Excellent. Too, so. That's at MRBR. We're pushing for that. So, so it sounds like we did, did the best we could for the resource and the people. So and we'll monitor it. Anything else? I have, I have a question. Yes, sir. So um, if you'll scroll down, who is this copy to? I mean, does the council member have a copy of this or anybody in the community have a copy of this? Because I know I'm going to call about it. I know um, that. So well, is, it, is it available online? or It's public record. I mean, it's, so I would imagine it'll be part of this record. It's in the folder okay. for this stormwater management committee, and I'm sure the secretary can get okay. you a copy. So they can just contact staff and get a copy yes, if they need to. Okay. Yes, sir. I have a question too. Mr. Hunt, you mentioned uh, uh, something about the the deed for the property and, and some of this verbiage being incorporated into that. Is that, is that correct? So in, in the event that the property sells, but a new ownership group comes in just like these folks have. Yes, sir. These rules will still apply, but in this document, we have stated the Fontenelle group or the ownership group specifically. So I'm assuming that's going to be amended to owner of property or however it needs to be legalized. Yeah, I mean, this was worked through with their attorney. So um, we regulate on a couple of different ways. This site we're regulating on SCMs, and we also regulate the variances. So uh, the what we record on properties relating to stormwater control measures, that is out for, we, we record that where future owners of the property will be able to know what is on a site uh, beforehand. So uh, that's how we do that on those. And there are certain documents relating to this site that would be recorded as well that would show, show these things to include the buffer. Okay, great. Yeah, this one seems pretty unique considering the things that we deal with here. So it seems like there's maybe a setting of a precedent in a way. So making sure that we've got this, that ironed this out. This site has had a series of variances over the years. Mm -hmm. So I would say it is unique. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, the point I made earlier about us, this being a somewhat perennial issue is partly because um, um, decisions were made in past variances that we might not have made today in this current context, particularly post-2010 and post-climate change storms becoming more intense, more concentrated in smaller areas like Seven Mile Creek recently. And, um, and the fact that they've had lots of changes of ownership and lots of changes as of staff. So I think your, your point's very well taken. Unfortunately, this type of matter generally, I think, is probably limited to SEMs and the variance criteria, not necessarily to the deed. But we, but we have had those kinds of requirements in, in the past with other projects, particularly with cut and fill requirements, where, where, Any, where they tell us up front they're going to be multiple parcel owners. So we do have those options where we can where we can get the applicant to work with us voluntarily, or where we decide that's what we need. Do you want me to go? Um, so we do use um, like declarations of real or restrictive covenants to be recorded against the property to run with the land. Um, to um, put subsequent property owners on notice. As, as you stated correctly, the, um, the grantor on that document would have to be the owner of the property yes. for that to be effective. I have the sentence if you want me to read it. Do we need to? 
Right. Only, if, <laughs> only if you guys request it. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not running for re-election, but I am. I do like to be likable. So, <laughs> so move, moving forward is often a good way to stay likable. So, all right, and I'm belaboring that. All right, next topic. Is that okay? All right, no objection. All right, all right. River North. Uh, thank you, Chair. So, River North. Um, not what you're requesting, but uh, the River North. Uh, we had a couple projects that came before a variance committee, and that uh, that was granted. Uh, I think the one you're asking for an update on was we had one case that actually requested uh, deferred uh, compensation of the fill. Um, this, uh, <laughs> I think, it came before the committee uh, every month for what seems like maybe six to eight eight, eight cycles in a row. Um, long story short they decided not to request a variance for the deferred comp, uh, compensation, and that went away. Uh, and, and I think if you've looked in the, um, in the newspaper, you've heard that, um, that there's a, a new potential buyer on the property, and uh, I think the request will probably not come back uh, based on the preliminary discussions that we've had with the, uh, the new designer. Yeah, that's, that's a really good example of the question you asked um, specifically, that if, if we state our expectations clearly and articulately, it has a ripple effect with how many people find the need to bring a appeal or a variance to us. Yeah, my, my comment was just in, in the furthering of, of having short, efficient meetings so that we don't find ourselves repeating ourselves with these same requirements every time due to a new ownership group. So that's that's where I'm headed. Yeah, I would, yeah, we missed so many meetings over the last few months. I actually <laughs> called Mr. Mishu and said, did we say something harsh? <laughs> Whereas people, you know, or did we do something wrong? Right. Or people like investigating us for yeah. something we did? You know, no, no. I said, we just haven't had any requests for applicants. And I used to work for a gentleman who said, you know, the presence of, of an enforcement is usually uh, the presence of a failure, you know, with compliance. Yeah. And it, it, enforcement's needed and necessary and appropriate when it's needed, but we'd much rather have compliance and have people following the ordinances without asking for variances right because they're, they're they're political compromises anyway they're not ecological ideal so we'd much rather people stay in with within those boundaries because they're only going to make the environment generally worse when we compromise that's just the reality agreed all right okay so anything else from river north and not unless there's specific questions okay. from uh, the committee members okay great great so uh, so sometimes it pays to go through a little bit of pain to avoid a lot of future work so all right fema flood insurance the honorable roger lindsay emeritus thank you mr mishu microphone controller for the benefit of our newer members uh, i've been with metro water storm water for their for going on 13 years now uh, for the first 10 of those, I was over the development review group, which is now part of the larger development services section. And now I'm the section chief for the, the master planning, stormwater master planning group. Um, and, and the range of my responsibilities largely falls to things that nobody else wants to fool with. So um, part of my job description is that I'm the bearer of bad news. Um, so, but... I've been asked to talk today about risk rating 2.0, and, and I want to start by saying that, that what I want to do today is, is very quickly, because I've got a, an interview scheduled in less than an hour with somebody from E&E &E News about the March flood. But this kind of began with the, with the publishing of multiple articles beginning in February of this year. Cassandra Stevenson with the... Uh, the Tennessean started off with an article, Rates May Rise for Flood-Prone Areas, followed a month later by an article, Flood-Prone Areas Could See Rates Leap Over 500%, followed then by an article in April, How FEMA's New Flood Insurance Pricing Will Impact Your Wallet. And this was really a pretty good article, uh, Cassandra, I think, as she's worked her way through her study and, 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 and investigation through this series of articles really tied this pretty well um, to what risk rating 2.0 
really constitutes. So there are um, about, when we talk in terms of how many, there are 27,500 uh, flood insurance policies in force in the state of Tennessee. I think some, it, it, it varies depending on how close you are to the last big flood, but we've had as many as 3,500 to 7,000 flood insurance policies just in the Nashville, Metro, Davidson County area. But risk rating 2.0 represents, from FEMA's perspective, the first time in about 40 years they've changed the way that flood insurance policies are rated. So for these first 40 years, dating back to when the first of the flood insurance rate maps were issued across the United States, our maps, our first set of maps in, in the metro area was, was in the early 1980s. About 1983, I think we had our first set of maps, and we continue continue to upgrade those maps. Um, uh, in fact, we're in the midst of two more releases of, of updated map panels. We totally updated in 2017. We've got about 50 more panels that are close to the point of be becoming submitted uh, to become effective panels. And then there are another 18 to 25, the number escapes me, new panels that are in the really in the development process. We've actually have already begun the review of preliminary panels on this last uh, smaller uh, group, but they mostly represent creeks that have never been studied before. When you look at the flood maps, you, you, you often see in the upper reaches of a creek a line that crosses the mapped portion of the map of the, of the creek that says, you know, limits of study. And beyond that, you're officially not in the floodplain. Even though you are in the floodplain, you're officially not in a map component. You may be required by staff at Development Services to do your own model if you're outside that range just to make sure that you're not designing something that falls into a risky area. But So we've relied on those maps over the years, and we, we really have some of the most thorough, complete, you know, we've, we routinely rely on LIDAR, uh, light detecting and, and reading range um, to update our maps. Um, the Corps of Engineers does all of our modeling. They do a phenomenal job. They, it's, it's the same group. They, they know our system, and they, they continue to add more to it. Um, so when we look at, at risk rating 2.0, uh, I'm going to rely on, on, on some comments in, a, in a, a, a document that was provided by the Association of State Floodplain Managers. Um, and I believe my phone's ringing over there, isn't it? <clears throat> It'll stop in a second. I don't think the mic got it. So, so. When, when we look at, at the, the Association of State Floodplain Managers is a national organization of, of probably some 15 or so thousand members, uh, and, it, and it's the, the, the organization under which is recognized some 10,000 certified floodplain managers. And a good number of us, uh, upwards of a dozen of us here at Metro, are certified floodplain managers. Uh, show of hand, who's a certified floodplain manager? Lo Logan is, Steve is, anybody else? Cert Michael is. Um, so, uh, and it, and I I'm privileged uh, as of January this year to have been appointed president of the Board of Regents at the, the national organization over the certified floodplain manager program. So I'm, I'm largely responsible for the, the. Um, the, the training, the testing of, of 10,000 uh, certified floodplain managers around the country. Um, as such, I write a lot of exam questions as well, so. But I don't ever reveal the, the contents of an exam. So by comment, the ASFPM says, risk rating 2.0 is designed to establish insurance premiums. It does not change how flood insurance rate maps, the firm maps that we've always used, or the flood insurance studies of which those firm maps are part are used for floodplain management and regulatory purposes, not for lender compliance with the mandatory purchase requirements. Um, the special flood hazard area that we've always used and regulated to will remain, will remain in effect. We will use that. And in fact, I, I, I just mentioned we've got many new panels that are in the process of being released. So with risk rating 2.0, 
Uh, flood hazard zones, rating tables, elevations, that's always how we've rated for insurance purposes. And I say we, I'm talking about insurance agents, that when you buy a new house and you have a mortgage, you've got to go through that process of, if you're in the floodplain, you've got to get your flood insurance. And, and those were the criteria that were used. Um, instead, FEMA will be utilizing state-of-the-art industry technology with data from the National Flood Insurance Program, from NOAA, from the Corps of Engineers, from USGS, uh, and other organizations to establish a new risk-informed rating plan that incorporates a, a broader range of flood frequencies and sources, including pluvial flooding, drainage and urban flooding due to heavy rain. Uh, it also factors additional geographical variables, such as the distance to water, the type and size of the nearest bodies of water, the elevation of the property relative to the flooding source, and building specifics, essentially the cost of, of, uh, of replacement. So NFIP premiums that are calculated under Risk Rating 2.0 will reflect an individual property's flood risk rather than national averages. So what this means for policyholders is most most, and there are several organizations that describe this as saying most can, can expect a reduction or a minimal change in premium cost of that component. The larger part of most is that they will see a minimal increase in their premium cost. Obviously, it's, the reason for changing is because the NFIP, the, the flood program, is in, is in arrears by some $26 billion. So, if you can, if if you put you know lipstick on a pig and say that most are going to see reductions, that's not going to get, that's not going to make up the twenty six billion dollars in arrears. Um, but uh, and I'll talk a little bit more just about what we really expect to see um, when we when we talk in terms of Tennessee as part of the documents that the, that FEMA has released. They have a state specific uh, fact sheet that they've come out with, and for Tennessee, it appears that that about 28% will see some reduction. Um, and then there's 59% that will see a small increase, and a zero to $10 a month. Another 8% that will see a larger increase of 10 to $20 a month. And then about 5% of our policies will see significant increases, um, greater than $20 a month, upwards of 240 a year. Um, and in some places, some of the earlier documentation that I saw um, on, on risk rating 2.0. They gave an example of, a, of a, a coastal county in Florida, a resort kind of a county. And so this resort county, of all of the structures within this county, and most of them have flood insurance because Florida is the largest state in terms of total numbers of flood insurance policies. Florida is the winner across the country. Um, but in this one county in Florida, the average annual flood insurance premium is $450 a year. Based on risk rating 2.0, those policies will jump to over $20,000 a year for, because of the risk and because of the, 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 the replacement cost of those structures. You're talking about million-dollar houses on the beach. Um, you don't get flood insurance for $450 a year for a million-dollar house that's subject to hurricane damage and things like that. So that's an extreme example of an increase. Um, uh, for, for the great percentage of houses that, can, that have, now that, that may be a different story for Mr. Dale over here. He, he probably is facing an enormous rise, but most policies will see smaller rises. Um, and by, you know, when we talk about, uh, about the benefits to policyholders, communities, the flood insurance industry, we're talking about creating an individualized picture of a property's risk. Uh, we're going to provide re rates that are easier to understand for agents and policyholders. Uh, we'll talk about reflecting more types of flood risk in the different rates. It will use latest actuarial practices to set risk-based rates. And then it reduces the complexities for agents to generate a quote. Now, the reason I said I was going to introduce this stuff, you know, it, it turns out that FEMA, within the last two weeks, has released multiple new volumes of guidance material. So I haven't committed any of that to memory yet. Um, 
but it's it's significant and it's probably really more complex than they would like you to be led to be to believe that it really is. But uh, from the standpoint of implementation, this is coming. Um, phase one, this phased implementation, uh, new policies, if you're getting a new policy beginning on October the 1st, you will be subject to risk rating 2.0. And beginning, beginning also on October the 1st, if you're an existing policy holder that's eligible for renewal um, and, and you're subject to a decrease, those will also go into effect in, on October the 1st. Phase two, uh, about a year out, all policies renewing, 11 months out, all policies renewing after April 1st of next year will be subject to the risk rating 2.0 rating methodology. So it'll, it'll take full effect next year. Um, but the impact is, as FEMA experienced in 2012, when, they, when, the, when the, one of the prior large uh, reauthorizations of the National Flood Insurance Program, um, when that came forth in 2012, it was, it was called the Bigger Waters Act. It, it radically restructured um, the way the NFIP program works. But it also was subject to a lot of significant increases. And, and in states like Louisiana, where there, there are vast numbers short of what Florida has, but Louisiana has a lot of flood insurance premiums, and they're on a lot of, of lower value homes. And the, the, the rate of increase was so substantial that there was, uh, there was a near revolt down there. And Congress backed off and said, oh, wait a minute, we're not going to immediately implement large increases in the premiums, but we're going to limit your rise to 18% a year. And, and every year we're going to raise your rate by 18 more percent, 18 more percent, 18 more percent, until we get to an actuarial rate. That, that process will, will, will play forward in, in exactly the same way. If you're, if you're in that 5 and 8% and right at the very tip where you expect to see significant increases, it's only going to rise by 18% a year. Um, so in terms of this, this whole thing and the way, FEMA, the way FEMA slants this, is it's about equity, equity related to cost. Um, we're talking about a robust actuarial rating approach that's going to decrease rates for lower value homes, and then those with more expensive homes could see increases. Um, and then there's the affordability issue, and affordability issue again is that is that whole process by which you know what's what's too much, and apparently there's um, some work being done in Congress right now to further discuss affordability issues. And, um, and Congress is expected to, to tailor an approach to affordability when they, because the next reauthorization for NFIP is in, is in um, September of this year, September 21. We'll see another reauthorization of the NFIP. So that was a quick summary, a quick introduction. And um, if anybody has any questions, I'd be glad to address those. Anybody got any questions? been quite a bit of news coverage about this and uh, different parcels, you know, uh, have been, I think, discussed in the news in relative to how much their rates are going to go up. And, and it's just a, an effort to cover our risk. And, you know, uh, it is. There, there have been a, a number of efforts to try to to make this whole insurance, flood insurance program better uh, in the last two to three years, there's been a lot of discussion about private flood insurance. Uh, for, for decades, FEMA was the only game in town, and now there is a lot more private insurance. But, and then there was a lot of concern by the, on the part of FEMA that, that private insurance wouldn't, have, wouldn't hold to the same rigorous requirements, uh, and that people would, would, would seek private insurance on the assumption that they could skirt some of the, the maybe the, the upgrade, update, um, bring yourself into compliance kinds of requirements that exist in FEMA's program. Um, there's, I think, a, a more of a sense now that some of the private insurance products just aren't as, as, as good as, as the overall kind of package that the FEMA sponsored insurance uh, provides for, uh, that, that people are are ending up with a little more exposure maybe than they thought they were. And, and then I think, too, there's, we're seeing increase in cost of private insurance as well. So it's not, it's not the, you know, a, a 
super alternative to, to FEMA insurance uh, that, that some thought it might be when it first when it first became more of a mainline kind of thing. Yeah, the private sector is much less tolerant to subsidizing risk to make it affordable. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, and you all just bought your 400th house, is that right, Rogers? Yes, we're over 400 houses now. Um, that means houses in floodplains. Flood and this dates back to uh, some three, 300 houses since May of 2010. Um, and um, but we had been acquiring houses in really seriously flood-prone areas, areas along Wimpole Creek. Some of you, may, I mean, Wimpole Drive, which is on Mill Creek, we had bought about 15 or 20 homes in a row there. We'd bought a lot of houses on Dry Creek up in, and we'd elevated a lot of houses on Dry Creek up in the Goodlettsville area, just south of Goodlettsville, the, the, the metro portion of Goodlettsville. <clears throat> There's a, um, a flood control, a weir structure on that Dry Creek uh, that holds water back upstream of the interstate that, that prevents some houses below the interstate from flooding. Um, so we, we've been buying houses for a good while, 300 since the flood. Uh, we had 100, close to 100 houses in our Corps of Engineers project that's underway right now. We've, we've I think, have bought about 20 houses in the Mill Creek and Seven Mile Creek Basin um, uh, since um, the Corps of Engineers project was funded in the last two to three years. Um, we've added another 150 houses to our list since the March 2021 event. Um, we've got to characterize that, that storm. Um, there were at least 500 or more houses significantly impacted by water in the March 2021 event. Um, there were over 10,000 reports of water in, water in my crawl space, water in my, you know, my, my shed washed out into the, the street in front of the house. My, uh, it was a significant event. And um, um, I did a presentation a couple of weeks ago with the Urban Green Labs, which you can you can go on Google search that and look, and you can, I, it, I try to cr create some chronology of these severe events. We've had, we've had an eight to ten inch rain event every year, at four out of the last five years, and so um, this was was one of those, um, and it, it was a lot of rain that was centered in that in that Seven Mile Creek, uh, Mill Creek area, um, McCrory Creek over below the Percy Priest Reservoir. There was, there was damage, um, there was damage in Richland Creek, um, uh, relatively a little north of the city, but um, the Whites Creek, Whites Creek has been the, the you know, they, they were 10 inches, a 10 inch rain in the, what we call the remnants of Harvey storm in August of 2017. Um, and so they're just happening with greater and greater frequency. And so our, our target for homes to buy for buyout purposes, those properties then are held by Metro in perpetuity, especially those, those that are purchased with FEMA grant dollars, uh, hazard mitigation grant program dollars uh, have to be held by Metro forever. Um, we get lots of calls. A lot of people are interested in that lovely vacant lot over by the creek and uh, they're not for sale. And um, so that's kind of the way that program, and it's been a, an effective program. We've bought a lot of houses. Um, there are a lot of cities around that are doing exactly the same thing. Some have bought far more than 400 houses. Um, and I think Cedar Rapids, Iowa has bought over a thousand, but they've had two major, major flood events um, in um, the last 12 years. So uh, cities like Ellicott City, Mar Mar Maryland had two, um, 1,000 year storm events within the span of three years, uh, earlier this decade. Um, they're freak events, um, and they're happening with increased regularity. And, and as I often say, I don't care what your, what your politics are, or what you think about climate change, there's some funky stuff going on with the weather. So, okay. <laughs> thanks, sir. Thank you, Mr. Lindsay. So now you all know why I called him Emeritus Roger Lindsay. I mean, I, I knew he was president of the Board of Governors, and so uh, you know, efficiency in meetings uh, forces all of us to tell our own story. Sometimes I really appreciate you telling what an amazingly placed, professional, and experienced person you are. Because he. No. Uh, it's, well, I learned it all here at Stormwater. So, <laughs> That's you know, in was, Nashville, yeah. I spent 30 years in the water wastewater industry, and, and I, I enjoy what I do, and I, I, I have found this to be a, 
I told Tom recently that when I signed on, I, I thought, well, you know, where I am at my station in life, you know, five or six, seven years, and that'll kind of wrap me up. I'm 13 years in now, and, and um, you know, when the opportunities to serve, to serve at a national level, to, um, but just to kind of continue to stay engaged in this industry and, and, um, and, and to work with, you know, this great bunch of folks here at Metro, and, and um, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure so there'll anyway. ever be another generation that got to see the modern environmental movement launched in the 60s and 70s yeah. and now benefited from all of that training and all that experience and all that insight of writing it. And the next generation uh, one day is going to have to learn all that stuff we lived. And so yeah, it's a real blessing. Those of us that have been around for a while remember the, the, the transition. That, that I started off in, in the late 70s uh, in the Clean Water Act stuff, you know, the, the, the old um, tool on facilities planning process where we planned for, for wastewater. It was all wastewater related. And, uh, and then the, old, the, the 80s was a decade of the water industry, the drink, Safe Drinking Water Act passed. And, then Superfund and RICRA. Uh, I've done a lot of Superfund site remediation work and and um, had the joy of participating in some phenomenal uh, litigation associated with some Superfund projects. And and um, and it just kind of wrote to every decade there was a new big area of study. So stormwater, I remember when they first, we started permitting for stormwater. How in the heck are you going to do that? You know? Stormwater is a ditch out front. You, know, you can't put a permit on a discharge from a ditch. So it's been pretty amazing. So well, anyway. Thank you, Mr. Lindsay. And I like you, you uh, <laughs> and like you, I agree, Mr. Dale does not deserve most of what happens to him. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mr. Mishud, or Mr. Hunt, do we have anything else? Or? I, I think we delayed the epic presentation. Okay, yeah, please. All right, um, so I know y'all are tired after a long meeting and I'll try not to take too long on this. Um, Rebecca, do you have the um, PowerPoint? Can you put it on screen? If you don't, I can send it to you maybe. Steve, do you know where the PowerPoint is? While this they may be a really this, quick presentation. I'm gonna remind you that you're supposed to respect your elders. <laughs> <laughs> I assumed you were younger than I was, Roy. I think I'm the only person Hang on just a second. Let me um, email this presentation so that you all can see it. Mr. Chairman, do you mind if I ask a housekeeping note real quick? Please, yeah. They, they, we love to fill void spaces. We just don't like to add them. This is the agenda. first time we're playing with the tablets? Uh, what worked well, what didn't work well, what would you like to see happen differently? I think if we could work on the, um, the how do you keep it lit longer function. <laughs> that, I, uh, that I, I will change all that uh, before your next meeting. Yeah, and yes, I, I don't think that's, I know that's not your own fault. The tablet appears to be limited to a five minute. This monitor screen's out of filter though. Yeah. yeah. I don't have any control on that one, but I'll, I'll, I may check on uh, <laughs> with general services. Yeah, we get, I think it's the first time we've used this space and that we've used it in, in over a year. I know other commissions have been coming a little more frequently, but all right, we ready for the ethics? Sorry, I forgot about that. No problem. Thank mm -hmm. you for putting that up, Rebecca. Um, so um, this is something that um, the, the mayor's task force on public integrity um, recommended, um, and it's not just directed at stormwater. We've been um, asked to develop this presentation and present it to all of the Metro boards and commissions. Um, basically, it's sort of a refresher, a useful refresher, especially maybe for our new committee members um, uh, to um, go over some of the um, kind of uh, conflict of interest and ethical constraints on you as well as we get into open meetings a little bit and, and some of the other um, general areas um, of uh, like board or committee member um, conduct and, and issues that, t that tend to come up often. Um, and so hopefully this presentation will be useful for that purpose. Um, so Rebecca, you can go on to the second page. Thank you. Um, go ahead and let the bullet points march down. Thank you. Um, so the, the first, um, there, as, as I said, I think there's actually six um, goals of the 
there we go, <laughs> of the training. Um, the first being um, to understand um, what benefits you can't accept related to your role in, on the board. And, and really that's, if it's related to your role on the board, you can't accept much. Um, uh, to understand when you might be biased or have a conflict and the obligation to recuse yourself um, would come up. Um, to remember to disclose knowledge you have received about an agenda item from outside the meeting. To remember to articulate the specific reasons and basis for your decision, which I think you all are actually quite good about doing. Um, and to understand that the Open Meetings Act prohibits deliberation outside the board meeting and Public Records Act makes almost all of your emails related to stormwater issues open to the public. And um, understand the best practices for making informed decisions. All right, can we go into the next slide regarding the first goal? Um, whoops, one back, yeah, goal, goal one, yeah, that's it. Um, so the first source of authority that applies to you all is um, a chapter of the Metro Code, Metro Code um, Title II, Chapter 222. Um, which governs ethics and conflicts of interest. Um, and it refers to the defined term of Metro employees. So Metro employees do include members of any board, agency, commission, or authority. So even though we don't actually pay y'all <laughs> for this purpose, you count as employees. Um, <clears throat> and then it has um, two, section 2222020 in particular, has kind of a laundry list of the things that employees should not do. And so here are some of these things. They should not accept or solicit any benefit that might reasonably tend to influence them to act improperly in the discharge of their official duties. They shall not use Metro property services or funds for personal purposes. They shall not use non-public Metro information for personal gain or for the gain of any family member or other employer. And going on down, shall not use a metro position improperly to secure unwarranted privileges or exemptions for themselves, relatives, or others. Shall not accept other employment which might impair their independent judgment in the performance of their metro duty. Um, there are a couple of exceptions to that, if, if any of y'all ever have any questions about that. Accept any benefit which the employee should reasonably believe was intended to influence any action taken in the employee's official capacity. And, like I just said, um, as we go through these, um, if any of these stand out to you, you can certainly ask me questions here today, but also you can call me anytime. Um, when we get into the open meeting stuff, I will explain that y'all shouldn't be calling each other in between meetings to talk about substantive issues, but um, it's always fine for you to call staff. It's always fine for you to call me with questions. Um, so, so feel free to reach out on anything that's specifically applicable to you. Um, and if you would go on down to the, the next slide, thank you. All right, so here's the, the exceptions to the rule. These are the types of benefits that you can accept if no conflict of, or appearance of conflict otherwise exists. Um, awards of trifling value publicly presented in recognition of public service, like a paper, uh, like a, 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 a a medallion is a good, a plaque, yeah, you know, a paperweight is what I was thinking of, because that's what I always used to get for some reason. But um, uh, gifts unrelated to a person's position as a Metro employee, so of course your family members can give you birthday presents and whatnot, um, meals, beverages, foods, promotional items, or hand-produced items of a value up to 25 from a single source in any calendar year. And that, that rule, I have an anecdote about that, which is that rule was changed. Originally, you couldn't accept anything except food if it was under $25, and then only if it was under $25. So at one point during a council meeting, um, we were watching some um, kind of introductions at the beginning of the council meeting, and um, one of the um, uh, people who was being introduced, um, uh, kind of in an honorary capacity, um, handed the um, a council member a baseball hat as a gift. And um, so one of my colleagues in the back of the room quipped, that's okay if he eats the hat. <laughs> but now you can actually wear the hat instead of having to eat it as long as it is worth less than $25. But only one hat a year. 
Yes. <laughs> One hat a year. Um, free or discounted admissions tickets or access to events or travel expenses from any single source of an aggregate value in any calendar year of up to $100, or tickets of a face value in excess of $100 if that event is generally recognized as an annual fundraising benefit sponsored by a nonprofit organization. So that's that last thing is the exception. Um, so this one is tough because only $100 a year from any calendar source, you know, this one comes up pretty often that people get offered a trip or a speaking engagement of some kind or something like that. And if it is offered to you in your capacity as a stormwater management committee member, then you can't exceed that $100 limit. Like I said, except for that exception, if they're giving you tickets to a nonprofit benefit, then you can. All right, um, going on to the next one. Metro code 2222040 creates the Board of Conduct, um, which is another board like you all are, but their sole purpose is to hear complaints and render advisory opinions about the standards of conduct or an executive order which regulates the ethical standards of conduct for employees of the metropolitan government. Um, so um, it is possible um, for someone to file a complaint against anyone who meets the definition of employee, including board and commission members, and those complaints will go before that board of con conduct. Um, also, and this is not done a whole lot, but it's theoretically possible, any elected official or member of a board, such as yourselves, can request an advisory opinion from the board re relating to compliance. So I would hope you would start with me, and I would certainly try to help you and answer the question for you as, um, as well as I could, but if you felt like you needed a formal written opinion, advisory opinion from the Board of Conduct, you, you would be within your rights to ask for one. Um, so again, as I was saying, complaints regarding elected officials or members of the boards or commissions are made to the Board of Ethical Conduct. And the Department of Law, and that would not be me, there is another attorney who staffs this board, um, investigates, evaluates, and makes a report to the board regarding whether the facts, if proven true, would amount to an ethics violation. Um, if, the, if the answer to that is yes, then the board, board decides to hold a hearing. Um, and if a hearing is held, the parties are given an opportunity to present your case. You know, just like any other due process hearing, you have the right to be represented by counsel, you have the right to present witnesses and so forth. Um, the penalties for violations. Um, so the Board of Ethical Conduct could recommend that the, to the counsel that the person be censured. They could recommend that the person resign his or her position. They could refer the matter to the district attorney general for prosecution if they believe it constitutes a violation of criminal law. And they could refer the matter to the director of law requesting that civil action be initiated for restitution or other relief. On um, that last one, I'm not aware of us ever being asked to do that. So don't, don't worry that that's like a common thing that happens. Um, the next one. Um, uh, this is the second of the six goals that we started out with. Understand when you may be biased or have a conflict and should recuse yourself. So you have a duty of independence. So you can't act based on your self-interest, based on a bias in favor of people you know personally, or based on the interests of the director or contractors with whom your board interacts. You must be impartial and act based on the law and the evidence presented to you. Again, I've always found this committee to be good at that. So here's how you answer the question, I have a potential conflict. Should I recuse myself? You should recuse yourself if you are biased based on a personal interest. And a lot of times, this is a personal financial interest. And the way you can kind of calculate that is by determining whether you will gain or lose money that in a way that results or financial benefit, a benefit that has financial value fairly directly from the decision. If you are biased or prejudiced for or against any party, either as an individual or as a member of a group. For example, if you're close friends or business partners with someone and cannot be objective. If you cannot fairly or impartially weigh the evidence because you have prejudged the fact issues. And you can see if you'll actually if you'll go back to that screen for just a second, Rebecca, you can see at the bottom there that there's actually a citation to a case um, that these standards come from. And that can happen. So these issues can end up in court um, before judges um, and, um, and, and get addressed in, in judicial case law. So um, we, we really do have to take these seriously, which I'm sure you would, but just to emphasize that. Next screen, sorry. 
Um, now, you do not have to recuse yourself if you will not lose or gain any financial benefit fairly directly from the decision. And if you can be objective and do not believe that your participation will even create an appearance of impropriety. In that case, however, in, in, I would err on the side of caution in resolving any doubt, doubt you should disclose that potential conflict, but state that you believe that you can be unbiased and will participate. And if you're uncertain, again, please consult with staff and Metro Legal because it is possible that your um, participation could later be challenged on appeal. Um, okay, going on to goal number three, to remember to disclose knowledge you have received about an agenda item from outside the meeting. Um, now, in talking about this one, I sometimes go a little off slide just to explain that um, sometimes boards and commissions act in different capacities. Um, for example, the Metro Council is generally acting in a legislative capacity. Um, and when you're acting in a legislative capacity, it is part of your job to talk to your constituents. Um, when a board or commission is acting in an administrative or quasi-judicial capacity, which is usually the case with this board or commission, you're a little bit more like a judge. And judges are ethically required not to engage in ex parte communications. Um, and there is an AG opinion on this subject. So if a matter is coming before you and people are trying to contact you about it outside of the context of one of these open meetings, we would generally tell you that you should discourage that communication. Um, so again, it says knowledge can include attempts to lobby you outside of the meeting. Knowledge can include your expertise or experience with this type of issue or area of town when making a decision. Um, and really the only obligation that they're saying here is that you should disclose it. But again, um, not doing so could be an issue on appeal. So it is important to, and again, there's a citation to a, um, a Metro case um, where um, you know a judge had to address this issue. Um, so um, like I said, do take it seriously. Um, going on to the next screen. Okay, um, and like I said, you all are very good about doing this, but it is important to articulate the specific reasons and basis for your decision. Um, again, this is really important for appeal. Um, criteria in the relevant gu guidelines are lo and laws are something you should always be looking at in rendering your decision. The facts presented at the meeting Past experience with similar issues. Um, I think the chair was talking earlier about um, desiring to be consistent. Um, and studies by experts or specific observations made by the public. We certainly do when we have public members comment, um, have some observations like that, that that may be presented to you. Um, now, unacceptable reasons um, that you can base a decision on that can result into an unpleasant decision on appeal um, would be um, having just a lot of sympathy for the applicant. Um, that's maybe particularly important in this um, uh, context um, uh, where you all are hearing a lot of variance requests. and. Um, uh, you know, you only grant them when they are the exceptional hardship. Um, and sometimes people will have a very sympathetic sob story for why, um, you know, they should be granted a variance that is all about their um, personal situation um, or their, you know, financial circumstances. And those are not relevant considerations for you all to take into account in determining whether to grant a variance. So you do have to kind of um, resist that human tendency to be um, uh, moved by sympathy, I guess. Um, not to make it sound like y'all can't have any compassion at all, but just like en enough to keep you unbiased. Um, opposition that is not based on the relevant guidelines or laws. And so this does happen from time to time, like, um, uh, we have a lot of expertise on this committee where people have um, knowledge about other metro regulations and other contexts um, and, um, uh, you know, a lot of familiarity with certain neighborhoods in the city and um, uh, uh, concerns about the welfare of the community. And um, so sometimes we, I haven't seen it so much in this committee, but I have seen it in others where sometimes people will take a consideration that really is outside of your mission into account um, uh, in um, uh, trying to make a decision. Um, 
you know, where a project is deeply politically unpopular and you have like a huge crowd of 50 people here opposing it, you know, um, and a lot of times what the people will talk about is really not relevant to the, the mission of that board or commission. Um, so that with, it's with that kind of thing that you have to like try to really focus on what you're here to decide. Um, next screen, please. Um, board members should, okay, this is goal five, sorry. Understanding the Open Meetings Act prohibits deliberation outside of board meetings, and Public Records Act makes almost all your emails open to the public. And again, that wouldn't include your personal emails. <laughs> that would only include your emails about Metro business. Um, board members should absolutely avoid the use of email to discuss board issues or invite comments from other members concerning any public business. So um, the Open Meetings Act has a specific prohibition on um, electronic electronic deliberation. And um, so emailing each other about a substantive matter that you might need to deliberate or make a decision about at a board meeting um, could be in violation of that. And as you can see, that Johnston versus Metro, Metro has been sued over this issue and we have dealt with this in a court. So it is, again, something to take seriously. Um, it does not matter whether the email is a Metro email address or a private email address. So as long as it's about Metro business, even if you are using your personal email account, it can be determined to be a public record. Um, and violations of the Open Meetings Act make um, decisions based on those deliberations void. So that's the consequence. If you all were to deliberate outside of a meeting, whatever decision you reached would, not, would be void and you would have to like basically redo it um, over again in front of the public eye, properly noticed in an open meeting context, um, and you'd have to redo both the deliberation and the decision, so, um, because the original would not, not be valid. Um, and we have also had situations where judges will order court supervision of a board because they think this doesn't happen a lot, but it has happened to our boards and commissions um, where they think that they're you know, not being cautious enough about this. Um, they, they can actually, you know, nobody wants to be in a situation where they're being like deposed and you know, um, questioned um, for, for all of their um, uh, activities. Again, I, like you all are a good board and commission, you all know this stuff mostly already. Um, I'm not anticipating that anyone's gonna violate this, but you know, it's, it's good to be reminded about regularly. Um, so on to the sixth goal. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> the Open Meetings Act has a definition of the term meeting. And it's when two or more members of a governing body who have the authority to make decisions for or recommendations to a public body meet and make a decision or deliberate toward a decision. So that's usually what we're looking at, those two things, deliberation and decision making, which is voting. Adequate public notice must be given for all meetings. This is another requirement of the Open Meetings Act. Um, and our staff is very good about making sure that adequate public notice of the meetings of this committee are, are sent um, in advance. Um, the reason for this is that affected parties um, uh, need to be given an opportunity to realize that the issue that they care about will be on that agenda for that, that board meeting and um, will be able to have time to rearrange their schedule to be present or you know, um, write in an email or you know, whatever they want to do. Um, and Tennessee courts have determined that adequate public notice is sufficient notice under the circumstances that would fairly inform the public of the meeting. So it's not a bright line rule of a particular number of days or something like that. You can take specific circumstances into account. So sometimes when we have an emergency specially called meeting, there might be a little bit less notice than we would for you know, something that we have plenty of um, uh, advance notice of. Um, and, and that can be okay under the circumstances, although you can't push it too much. And let's see, next screen. So there are some things that you all can do that do not meet that definition of a meeting. One is an on-site inspection, a chance meeting or informal assemblage. I have never really understood what an, exactly an informal assemblage <laughs> would consist of, but I guess maybe if y'all are having like a birthday party or something like that. Um, Attorney-client meetings are called um, executive sessions. When you actually have a, um, when this commi commission, committee is being sued, 
or when we have a controversy or dispute where it looks like there's a decent chance that, that there could be a lawsuit from it. Um, you can meet um, individually, like well, collectively, but with your lawyer, um, myself or one of the litigators in my office or both. And that would be um, not so much a chance for you to deliberate and vote, but it would be a chance for us to do a one-sided informational presentation to you explaining the status of the lawsuit in a way that will preserve that attorney-client communication. And then you can ask questions and we can answer them. But again, in that executive session context, you can't deliberate or vote. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. So this is what just expired. So I'm going to go over it pretty fast because it really doesn't apply anymore. Um, I, I don't know what the future could hold um, in terms of the pandemic. Um, so maybe it's worth mentioning a little bit. But um, we had during, <coughs> excuse me, most of the period of the pandemic, um, an executive order in place that was issued by the governor. And that was what was allowing us to meet electronically during that period for about a year, really. Um, and it just expired April 28th. So you all are lucky that your meeting happens to fall at the very beginning of the month. And so you're one of the first in-person meetings to fall um, after the expiration of that, um, of that governor's executive order. Um, normally, under the Open Meetings Act, um, boards and commissions cannot meet electronically. Um, and so um, they had some specific conditions that were um, attached to the ability to meet electronically during that temporary period. Um, so go on to the next screen if you would. Rebecca, um, and again, this is kind of the list of conditions. Okay, um, I'm, no, you can go on to six. I'm not gonna go into that too much since it's expired. So understanding the best practices for making informed decisions. You all are very fortunate to have a really excellent staff, and um, they do this for you, but um, it suggests that we advise that best practices for staff are to provide a detailed agenda for each meeting, ideally at least a week, week ahead of time. This helps the public be informed of issues to be deliberated or decided, and the board may review relevant documents or contracts in preparation for the meeting. You can provide a staff report or recommendation for each agenda item in written or oral form with the reasoning behind this recommendation. And that's always done before the matters that come before you. And you can start each meeting with a declaration by any board or members of conflicts or recusals on agenda items. So that is the ideal way to do it. If you, and I think you all have usually done this in the past. Like if you have a reason for a recusal um, uh, it's good to kind of state that at the very beginning of the meeting. Like um, sometimes people, you know, may even let a matter be deliberated and then when the vote comes down to it, say, and like I'm saying, y'all don't do this, but I've seen this done. Oh, by the way, show me as abstaining on that one or something like that. Like it's better to just be really upfront about it if you do need to recuse yourself. Um, <clears throat> make sure you understand the work of the department, staffing your board. Meet the leadership, ask for a tour, review key organizational documents and contacts and understand the board's legal role and some history of past decisions. Before each meeting, review the agenda and copies of the relevant documents or contracts that you will need to make an informed decision. Ask questions about anything you don't understand. Note any conflicts that should be disclosed or warrant recusal. Consider adopting metrics for your board to measure whether you are acting timely or in accordance with your board's duties. And you all do have um, rules of procedure in Appendix F of the Stormwater Management Manual that um, have actually relatively recently been amended to kind of address some of those procedural um, standards that you, you follow. And then you can, and those are subject to further amendment um, upon notice and a, I want to say it's a supermajority vote. Um, uh, so go on to the next screen, please. That is it. So if you have any questions, I am happy to try to answer them and or you can always contact me um, at any time. The two attorneys with our office who um, uh, drafted this presentation um, are named on there as well and they'd be happy to take your questions also, but um, I can always be your first line of defense. All right, thank you, Ms. Costones. Any, anybody got any questions? Can we get a copy of those slides? Okay, all right. 
Okay, seeing none, I uh, will thank Ms. Costonis for that very thorough discussion of it's really important that we understand the details of our behavior. And you know, if you just think of yourself as a judge and a jurist and we have a room where these things are debated and learned about and you don't do it outside this room, it'll save you a lot of headache and a lot of other stuff. So I appreciate it very much. I watch you on TV, by the way, on your, your other legal counsel advising <laughs> sessions. It's how geeky I get about this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't seen this one before, but I, I do enjoy your other work, so I, I like putting it in, in that sass. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, let's state that for the record. I am a geek when it comes to this stuff, so. All right. Uh, so I think that's everything we had. The only other thing I wanted to mention is that we're going to According to Ms. Costonis' great briefing, we're going to publicly notice the fact that our vice chair uh, needs to take some time off uh, for, for personal health reasons. And, uh, and so we're going to need to vote at the next meeting on a, I'm going to propose that it be a temporary vice chair replacement because I, she's agreed to continue to serve as vice chair when she comes back. So we'll publicly notice that on the next agenda, if that's okay. And, uh, and take that up as a temporary position in case I'm not here and the vice chair takes over. And uh, other than that, I think that's it. So I want to thank all the hard work the staff put in the going out in the field and dealing with these folks and making this meeting function. And uh, I think we do need a formal motion to adjourn for the first time in a year. So anybody have a motion? I move that we adjourn. All right, motion's been made that we adjourn. Is there a second? I'll second. All right, motion made and properly second. Any discussion? All right, no discussion on this motion. That's right. So all those in favor say aye. 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 All, right. all opposed? All right, we are adjourned. Thank you. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.com.